And joining me on today's episode of the British Baseball Podcast, I am extremely happy and excited to be joined by some of Baseballing Royalty, the MVPs, Johnny, Josh and Eric. Welcome to the British Baseball Podcast. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to thank the three of you for um, all that you've done within the baseball community in Britain. Uh, for many of us, including myself, this was a gateway to the addiction that is baseball in this country. And I think for many people that are playing the sport in this country too, if it wasn't for the coverage that they've seen on Channel 5, that they probably wouldn't be playing or being as involved as they are now. So uh, if I had a laughter track, I wouldn't use it. I'd be using the applause track. Um, but you'll just have to take my word for it that everyone would be clapping and, and being really happy. So thank you very much for agreeing to come onto the show and talk about your new uh, podcast. But before we go into that... Um, would you like to tell us all a bit about yourselves and how you became interested in baseball? Johnny, would you like to, to kick us off? I think I've got the most dodgy beginnings, Max, so thank you for starting with me. Um, <laughs> I was very lucky. I started my TV career in 94, um, got my first job at the legendary, iconic cable sport, cable TV uh, in Croydon, uh, live and exclusive to London boroughs of Croydon, Sutton, Merton, Kingston and Richmond, potential audience of a million, in reality about four. Um, I spent two years doing that, uh, quit on the same day as my best mate, Titus Hill. He went off to Sunset and Vine, but we're doing all the late night stuff for Channel 5. I went off to the world of freelancing, picked up a couple of jobs that, uh, that uh, obviously nobody's ever heard of for channels that don't exist anymore. And um, he put my showreel in front of them because Tommy Boyd, the presenter in the first season in 97, went AWOL mid-season. And before I knew it, they gave me a chance, gave me three shows. Um, and uh, then they gave me the rest of the season and 12 years later they couldn't get rid of me so um, brutally honest and I'm sure the regulars of the show will remember um, absolutely clueless I think I'd seen two games prior to doing the show um, and then I spent the next 12 years being educated by, for my money, the three best sport pundits in the business, the Moose Man, Todd Macklin at the beginning, uh, Big Davey Lengel, and of course the legend that is on our screens as we speak, Mr. Josh Chetman. Oh, a great segue. Josh, uh, give us an overview as well. Yeah, well, I sort of went the opposite way that Johnny did to the show, which is I started with baseball and then backed into broadcasting. Uh, I was born in the UK, born in London, but grew up in Los Angeles, uh, played baseball, a vastly overachiever, not a lot of skills, but a lot of effort and heart, ended up getting to play uh, Division One college baseball at a school called Northwestern University in the Big Ten, and then played uh, briefly professionally in the United States. I happened to, as mentioned, been born in England, so got to play for the Great Britain national team and uh, did that for a decade uh, and had some reasonable success there. I started by playing with the national team, but wanted to get involved with baseball in the UK because it was one thing to represent the country, which I was very proud of. It's another thing to actually help develop the game. So I moved over to Great Britain, started working for Major League Baseball, and a good friend of uh, Johnny, Eric, and myself, Clive Russell, was my boss. I had worked as a journalist for a number of years, and through that job, I had had the opportunity to do some broadcasting work primarily serving as a pundit on uh, entertainment industry stuff. I covered uh, the film industry for USA Today for a number of years. And so when I came over, uh, there was a, a segue, a change in terms of the co-host with Johnny. And Clive, our friend, asked me whether I wanted to come and try out for the show. And I said, sure. So I went to the old offices of Sunset and Vine. And they had set up Jerry Rig, sort of this uh, fake studio. It was these two basically just you know, uh, little stools and Johnny was sitting on one, I was sitting on the other, there was a camera. And the only thing I knew about Johnny is that he had tried in vain to, to play the sport of softball and it was incredibly dodgy experience for him. So I just started taking, taking a little bit of the, 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 the piss out of the young man uh, who was young then, not so young anymore. And uh, we got along and uh, that was the start of a great friendship. I got to know Eric and uh, the rest is uh, some sort of history. And Eric? That, that, this is segue history here. Uh, fantastic. I know they basically, I, I couldn't have worked at the two best guys uh, um, in baseball, but the way I got into baseball is I'm a Montrealer from Montreal, Canada. Grew up there, born there, and then, you know, became an Expos fan when we were playing at the very decrepit Jerry Park Stadium. And then my youth, we had to live six years uh, in southern Ontario, not far from Toronto, and I, uh, I missed my Expos, and basically uh, uh, the, the nearest team. This is before the Blue Jays. Yes, I'm showing my age now, but uh, 
nearest team to, to where we lived was the Detroit Tigers. So we, yeah, I guess I became a Tigers fan. And because the Tigers were in the American League and the, um, uh, the, the Expos were in the National League, I didn't feel like that I was uh, uh, cheating on my teams. Right? Because then, let, let, let's say, let's, let's face it, they're not going to be in the World Series. I figured the Expos were never going to get there. And uh, so I felt like, you know, I had two loves in my life. And uh, then moved back to uh, Montreal uh, in my formative years and the teenage years. Took up baseball, playing baseball in, in high school. And I, I got to tell you, as a baseball player, I was terrible. <laughs> yeah, I was absolutely horrible. Uh, so then I figured, you know what, maybe I'll get to sports broadcasting, or I don't know. Then one day I decided to go to film school. And where did I go to film school? The London International Film School in Covent Garden, London. As a two-year program, I thought I'd go into the film industry. I was going to be the new Spielberg, the new Hitchcock, the new whatever you want, uh, uh, insert director name here. And, uh, and I thought, you know, two-year program in London. I'll head back to Canada in no time at all. But no, I sort of lingered around. And the next thing you know, if I don't know if people can remember this, this that you'll also be showing your age if you remember this. It's when Channel 5 launched. You had the Spice Girls, the launch. Uh, all five Spice Girls. Yeah, I cringe just thinking about it. And uh, they were showing baseball. And I thought, oh, this is great. We're going to uh, – we're, we're going to – I'll be watching live Major League Baseball again, finally, on television here in the U.K., instead of trying to tune in on armed forces radio and finding some random game. But, and here's my honesty. I, I thought like, well, you know, this, this show could do a, lot, a bit better and it's good, but it could be better. And I put my name for it to just, just come and help out. That's all it really was just to really help out in the studio. The next, thing you know, they, uh, the, the people at Sunset and Vine and I'll, I'll forget this, they said, Eric, do you want a job? I said, well, I've already got a job. I'm working in the film industry. He goes, no, 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 we, we need a lot of help. Can you produce the baseball show? And I thought, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. That, and, and by the way, do you know anything about ice hockey? And I said, well, I'm from Montreal. So, uh, yes, I, I know a lot about hockey. I'm a big NHL fan as well. And so, cause we just got the, the rights for the NLH. And I mean, like, oh yeah. Then you mean, you mean the NHL. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we I can do that too. So I, I thought, you know, like can the cameras on or Jeremy Beadle is like, this can't be happening. They're actually offering me two shows on um, of two sports that I love in the UK. And next thing you know, I'm producing. Next thing you know, like I'm, I'm yelling in Johnny's ear. Next thing you know, I'm working with Josh. And next thing you know, we're going to World Series and All Star Games and 12 seasons of bliss for me in my, in my career. Matt, just to put this in into perspective, when Channel 5 launched in 97, to give you a sense of just how important they felt sport was, the guy who was head of sport was also head of children's TV. He, by his own admission, knew nothing about sport. So in those early years, it was sheer utter chaos um, in terms of the sporting output. And, and obviously that impacted massively. I mean, um, JC won't know this because he wasn't around in 97, but during the World Series, that first ever World Series, we're live covering the World Series. And I think it was game one. We had a bottom of the ninth situation, bases loaded, two outs, and they took us off air. Um, they literally took us off air because they wanted an hour to prepare for the Channel 5 news program in the morning. And I've, I've got to do a voiceover apologizing to viewers who've been up for four plus hours. It was total and utter chaos. Um, and so the fact that out of this grew a program that lasted for 12 years on Channel 5, the only show that was on the channel from 97 to 2008, is a minor miracle. And then when you hear the backstories of JC, a film critic, coming over here working in the MLB office, you know, Eric, an illegal immigrant, you should have been back in Canada, ends up producing not one but two of the shows, and me, a completely useless, washed-up ex-actor who did a, a spectacular failure in everything I'd ever tried to do in my life and ended up presenting the role for 12 years. I mean, it was just fate. I don't know. I don't know if there's any other way to, to describe it. We were just but, all unbelievably lucky that we all came together and it worked. But that, that, that was the key to the show, right? Goldie, is that it had a garage feel to it. Um, you know, whether it's Davey Langell or Todd Macklin, we just all were appreciative to be doing this work and wanted yeah. to have fun with it. And I think that always showed in the show. Eric, what, what was the budget for the set? What was the budget you worked with? You know what? I'll, I'll be honest as well. They never told me. And then when I'd say, like, hey, listen, we need, a, and we, we need a new backdrop. I think I forget which player we had in the back that was already retired or moved on to another We'd team. Moved to another team. That's right. Yeah. And I said, like, we got to change it. No, no, no. We have, there's no money in the budget. So, well, we can't have 
whatever I think it was uh, I forget what it was, but it, it was we can't have so and so player still in that in that. Was I it, think was yeah, it, Randy, it was, was, it was Randy, Randy Johnson Tom? still being an Arizona Diamondbacks. Yeah. Cap. No, Mariners. Or Seattle, Mariners. 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 That, that's how long ago it was. Yes, it was a Mariners cap. Is it? So as I imagine, you know, if you're a sport, if you're a football show, and you still have uh, Wayne Rooney wearing Everton shirt uh, in the early days when he's already in Man United, so. I, I don't know, but it was pretty meager, as as the second tell. And I loved we it. Had a meager, we had a meager budget, but but it was raw and it felt right. Yeah, but I loved it. I mean, I don't I don't think you spend more than a couple hundred quid every year, other than the backdrops, which were the only expensive bit. Um, but I loved it. I th- I just thought it, it 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 felt right. It looked right. It you know it and it did have that garage look and feel, but, which well, uh, it did it did change when we moved studio. So that the original studios had That's sort true. of like that plastic MLB sort of sign that you'd see like in your like man cave. And once we moved on to sort of the, the digital stuff. It, it, yeah, it, yeah, well, what about when I was doing the World Series in the early days and they were running over, they used to yeah. take us down to this little studio that was so small that the cameraman couldn't fit in. They had to lock the cameras off. And Josh, um, Todd and I were sitting side by side, literally like this, squeezed in into these tiny, what looked like a photo booth studio to finish off the show i mean we forget what it was like in the early days by the end i mean we looked relatively professional but uh, the early days it was sheer and us a pandemonium it sounds great though which did you prefer then did you prefer that sort of raw early winged it sort of vibe or did you prefer the polished and more clean cut bit which was more fun Matt, it was never polished. Let's just be clear <laughs> that the, the production value may have increased, but our attitude and approach was always, how shall I put it, deconstructed. Matt, and we I, were the most badly behaved presenters and most badly behaved producer. The things Eric used to do to both of us down our earpieces, one, he'd tell me he wants to wrap up like two minutes after the game's over. And I'm going, don't be ridiculous. We need to talk. And he said, look, we've only got two outs. One's in two minutes. The other one's in eight minutes. We all want to go home. Oh, we're going, and he'd get to, he'd start doing the count, and I'd just ignore him. I'd say, Oh, I think we've got time for another email. And he would be in my ear, and I apologize for the language, going, Bastard, 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 at the top of his voice down my earpiece. Meanwhile, he's doing something similar to poor old Josh, who's having to deliver something. Yeah, it was when I did the scores, I would do the scores and I would do the highlights. And in between, he would be trying to make me laugh while I was trying to read sort of the. This is our producer. This, this is the man who's going to be setting the tone and disciplining and controlling everybody. These are like uh, behind the scenes things that were, should never have been <laughs> surfaced uh, until I died or something. No, the world needs to know what a badly behaved producer you were. By the way, sorry, I, I, can I also just say, by the way, Matt, that uh, this is my first foray into uh, the, uh, the, the world of... Uh, here I, I used to think like TV is king and uh, what are these podcasts all about? And, and uh, not being used to these, uh, to, to these new Zoom broadcast thing, I, I think we're we're still bringing the uh, the rough edges into this element of broadcasting as well. I'm having an absolute blast. So like it, it does it just it just echoes back to the fun that you have on the show, and it's it's everything that I was hoping this episode would be. It's, it's brilliant. So long may it continue. Uh, one of the things I was going to ask you as well, uh, Eric, was how as a producer did you manage to keep these two under control with all the banter and fun that was going on, but I think that's just pretty much answered that conversation. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll, I'll cross that one off. <laughs> um, so what other changes did you sort of implement? Was it like a group thing that you just sort of decided that you were going to make the show um, as it was? Did you have a lot of input into it? The streamline into it. I mean, the, I mean, the guys were doing a good job anyways, and it was just, it was, it just I just felt it needed a little extra elements that, that would make the show more memorable. I, I still get, you know, I, th- I think somebody on the tube here in London once said it best to me that, uh, who stopped me and said, oh, I love the show and all, the, all this. People look back at, let's say, you know, well, uh, uh, that kind of show. Yes, you remember some certain games that were memorable, that, that stick in your mind that we would have broadcast, but they all remembered the Johnny and Josh going on the road trip thing. Uh, they remembered uh, my hot dogs thing. I remember um, uh, Johnny's leg cramping and live on air and he had to get up and, and, and shake his leg. Those little bits that, 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 that just stick in your mind. And, and, and people used to say they, were, they, 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 they somehow be angry at our show as well. Because it'd be like two, three in the morning, it'd be the fifth inning. They say, oh, I really, I can't, I, I can't stay up longer. I, I got to work tomorrow. I, I should get some sleep. 
And then John would say, oh, coming up next is the answer to the in-game trivia of Eric trying to stump Josh. And then they'd be, damn, I got to stay up for this now. I got I to know what the answer is. And and we would actually, by default, you know, I guess, keep people up later than they should. Not because not because they want to see the re result of the game. It's because they want to see what our next segment was, which was kind of like humbling for what we did on air. But, but also, I think we stumbled upon an approach that obviously worked, which which broke every every rule. I mean, people, they do it all the time now, but when we were doing it back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I mean, for instance, you know, you get caught short, you're doing a show for four, uh, a show for four hours and you're desperate for a wee, uh, you know, that's inevitable. And you think, I've got three outs, I can make it. And, and, and on occasion, I'd have my earpiece and I could, you know, I'd in the middle of doing my business and suddenly with two outs, Johnny, get back in the studio. And I'd come running back and I'm, you know, and literally they've come back to the studio. Any other show would, would maintain an air of professionalism and they would try and cover, they, they'd cut to John. Josh. No, no, Eric could have the cameraman filming me running in from the corner and therefore highlighting our total lack of professionalism. And in a bizarre way, I, I think our viewing audience rather loved that. I think that made them feel a much more homely part of it that, you know, that we just took down all the gloss and didn't even try to pretend to be good at what we did um, and just had a really good laugh. And I it was another, there's another time, remember, uh, John, Johnny was coming back from Spain on the day of a broadcast. He went, uh, went with his family on a, on a holiday in Spain. Then he calls me up from the airport in Spain saying, Eric, my, my, they said my flight's going to be seven hours delayed. I say, okay, well, what time are you, are you landing at Gatwick? And he goes, 11. He goes, we're on air at 12.15. Okay. That should be interesting. And we just knew that, okay, he's not going to make it. Uh, do we get a replacement? And then oh, I'm, I'm trying to find somebody like Mark Webster or Paul Romanik or whoever whoever can can cover. Uh, Mike Carlson wasn't available, and and, and this was a sh short notice. That was like, okay, well, I guess I'll do the first few innings. And and that's the thing. I, I can't imagine match of the day. So, you know, Gary Lineker saying, "Oh, I'm going to be late. Uh, so can you just do the first, you know, a few games until I get in?" And I sat in there and uh, with, with Josh and uh, trying to be Johnny, which wasn't easy. And uh, and yeah, yeah, like Johnny said, it's not. It's you know, there are a few shows can get away with that. We can I, sort I of think, make fun of it. I think the crux of what made it work is that, and why people liked it was that we never took ourselves too seriously. And I think that that's one of the problems that you have often with TV, which is you have these big egos. People take themselves so seriously. You know, it has to look completely clean. And we realized that we had limitations. We had certain skills, but we also had limitations. And if you're willing to just sort of throw your head back every once in a while and say, okay, I'm not the greatest, uh, people appreciate that and they respect that on some level. And I actually, I mean, I think this comes back to Eric as well. What TV show would, you know, a presenter turning up late from a holiday get away with it and actually embrace it and, and do something with it that, that, that sort of just enhanced the output? I mean, how many TV shows does the producer, one, is his name known, is his face known, and does he have his own appreciation society on Facebook? I can think of one, and he's on the screen right now. I don't know anybody else in television who's had Eric's role, and I think that says everything about the program. That, but but that... Let's, let's be honest, that Gouldy, that Eric always wanted to be on camera. That was like his little <laughs> secret passion, and he would be like, hey, no, hey. no, no, yes, 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 no, 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 yes, yes, yes. No, okay, no, if you force me. You Force see, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting much camera. T I'm not the one who's getting much camera time in this. Pie. I'm letting you guys roll free. So you know, just don't, don't, don't point fingers at me. <laughs> Eric, the highlight of the road trip, without exception, no matter how hard JC and I worked, was always your food segment. That's what yes. everybody waited for. You were the star, mate. Not us. We were just your ex bit parts. Ex except for the except for the dizzy bat race. I think that's the only time we ever even. Oh, that, that was a classic. Player. Let's uh, let's not go there. That's still a very painful memory for me. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, watching the show, it was like watching it with friends. Like you said before, you can't compare it to Match Day because it seems very regimented and very structured. But I did genuinely feel like I was with a group of guys enjoying a sport and, and taking it in. It felt very personal and very, very friendly. And I think, do you think that's why it became such a cult hit? I think the interactive nature, which we sort of accidentally stumbled on, was was a massive part to play. That's what gave people ownership and a sense of knowing knowing everyone and, and being a part of it and getting their names read, read out. You know, I still get people coming up to me. I got a, a young guy come up to me in an event I did towards the end of last year, and uh, and he said, 
can I get a, a, a picture? And I said, yeah, absolutely. He said, look, this isn't for me. It's for my dad. When he heard that you were, you were involved in this event tonight, uh, was telling me all about the years that he watched Channel 5 baseball. And he just will be beside himself with excitement. I mean, that's 10, 12 years after the show's gone off air. And he sent his son down to, to come out and say hello and, and say thank you. I mean, that's, that's pretty special. That, I think that says everything about the relationship that we, we were lucky enough to build with the viewing we, audience. We, we were reasonably early adopters for that type of interaction too, right? This is before Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Facebook was just starting right at the end of the show. So I think the fact that we were, and I, I always remember it, we'd have these piles. I think Goldie still probably has it in his loft. Have, piles have, of all the emails that he- I've got them all. <laughs> Goldie is fastidious for a guy who has the memory of a goldfish. And maybe that's why he keeps everything and he is so anal about it. So we have these, these binders of every single email we ever got and we would have these piles and we would determine the success of the show by how big the pile was of emails that people had sent but, in. But, Josh, do you remember that year that we said we want to break the record? It was during the World Series. Yeah. How many emails can we get on, this, on potentially the seven shows that we did? And, and we were doing over a thousand a night. And I, you know, and I always prided myself I'd read them all and I'm, I now have to put my hand up. I, I just didn't. I couldn't even get close to getting through them all. There were so many. Um, and, that's, and, and that's why I kept them, because I thought one day when I'm really old and doddery and, and nobody wants to come and say hello, I'll sit there and read them and chuckle to myself, and dribble, no doubt. Don't forget, when we first started, it was faxing your questions. We had a fax machine <laughs> that was right, right next to the VT uh, coordinator. And he'd be like putting in like, you know, tapes and highlights or whatever the next segment is. And then like rip out the, the fax and goes, Johnny, another fax came in. And that's and, how, uh, that's how old and this, is it, this is something you need to know, Matt. In those early days, you know, there were a fair few of who is this knobhead Johnny Gould. There were quite a few sort of very negative ones. And Eric was so lovely, he never showed them to me. And I think I only saw one accidentally. And I probably mourned and cried for about a week thinking no one loves me. Um, but he was ripping out the bad ones. I never saw the bad ones. It was only the nice ones. So in the early days, I thought everybody loved the show right from the word go. But I have to say, when you consider that the inevitably the world of, of any kind of broadcasting world, whether it's TV, radio or any sort of medium, you know, there, there are just as many people that think you're a complete idiot as there are people that love what you do. And that's, that goes with the territory. But I doubt I'll ever be involved in a program where the overriding feel was so positive. Um, I think it's highly unlikely I'll ever, ever have that experience again. And for that reason alone, that's why I, I look back on it. And, and I think I was blessed. It was the most amazing 12 years. Well, that's probably true for time and place too, Gouldy, if you think about it, right? Because first off, you're self-selecting. If you're up late at night, you're gonna, you can turn off the TV. It's not like you're going to be really competing with too many other programs. But secondly, we predated the troll era. So there were people who were trying to make their names by sort of taking down people and slagging them off. And so yeah. I think we were, we were pretty blessed by that fact too. Yeah, definitely. Do you think it would have impacted the way you did the show if it was like done in today's sort of times, if you had access to social media, do you think it still would have been as off the wall as it was? Well, probably not because Eric and I certainly are so old that we don't really understand social media. So I doubt it would have had any impact at all. We was just gone on oblivious to the changing world around us. <laughs> and would have been even more irrelevant than we were 10 years ago. I don't think we would have been the same. And I, I mean, I hope with this podcast, we will be the same because you got to be true to yourself. And I mean, we're just, you know, a bunch of guys, friends, longtime friends who like taking the piss out of each other, but also really love each other. And we know it. And that's sort of the core of what we're trying to do and what we tried to do then. And what we would, I think, always try to do if we were putting together a program. I'm very old school, Matt. You know, I, for me, any kind of broadcast media, whether it's a movie, it's TV, it's a play, you've got to remember, I spent 10 years as a spectacularly unsuccessful actor. So I've, I've had extensive experience in that world as well. The things that work, work because of the chemistry. I, I think it's the key word is the chemistry. And, and, and therefore, it doesn't matter what boxes you're ticking. If the chemistry between the people involved works, the program works. It doesn't matter what it is, TV broadcast, a news program, a sports program, a comedy. If that chemistry works, then you've, you've got something special. And at the end of the day, 
Um, I don't know how you create it. You either have it or you don't. And we were just very blessed. As JC rightly said, you know, we, we've been, we were colleagues for 10 plus years, but we've been friends for now 20 plus years and really, really good friends. And the chemistry therefore is, is everything. And hopefully that's what, well, it worked on the TV. That's hopefully what we're hoping to bring to the podcast as well. Lovely. Did you all hit it off straight away or was it like, a, do you have like a team building exercise that you all went on to sort of get to know each other a bit better? <laughs> idea that channel five would, <laughs> would seem really excellent. We, we, we went to no resort idea. and all got we all got face masks and massages. <laughs> Cumbers in the eyes. Well, Eric we was lying about paid, the budget. It was a bonus. If we got paid. It was a bonus. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. That's my wife always said. She's like, "You're not going to get paid this time." I'm like, "No, really, they're going to pay <laughs> they're me." They're going to pay me. Yeah. <laughs> another, another thing that you touched upon, Maddie, about uh, would we have survived this era? uh nowadays and i think it's, it's yes it is different now to the way we were there. but when we were on, on air we were the only show in town that you can watch baseball you know this is before mlb.tv before you can stream games on online before you can uh, subscribe to you know on apple tv to um, the to a baseball package so if you were if you were desperate for baseball uh from 1997 to 2008 we, we were the we were it this, you know, this is it. NASN came out. People came. Do so you remember that? Uh, pretty much the mid 2000s. Legendary Amory Smorts. Yep. That's right. But, we, but, but you had to pay for that. So we were the only ones that, you know, it, for free, might I add, free view that, that you can actually, even if you didn't like baseball, you'd accidentally stumble upon it, clicking channels and, what's this, what's, this, what's this sport? And then you shove in people's faces long enough, then, you know, they, they will bite. I, I've got to be honest, my great hope with this podcast is actually what Johnny's talking about, that level of chemistry, will really play very well on a podcast because to me, podcasts are all about having a really good relationship with your audience. And that's what we intend to do, what we hope to do, bring the exact type of relationship we had when we were on television to the podcast format because we sort of believe that's always the secret sauce in any sort of really good broadcast but even more so for podcasts were you surprised by the reaction that you got when you announced the the launch of the podcast yeah definitely um i, I mean silently you hope that you know there's still that silent uh, majority out there that that will buy into it um and as eric quite rightly points out there's an awful, awful lot more out there but yeah i mean but you said it yourself matt you know there are plenty of your listeners that that have no clue who we are I've never even heard of us um so we we've got a whole new audience to win over and, and hopefully be a part of and, and and obviously at my age you know the whole concept of a podcast i mean i really don't understand it i you know and i don't I, i've never never even thought that I would be involved in one but I can't believe how excited I am we're very lucky that we've got involved with Nat Coombs who's a lot younger than us hugely imaginative smarter, proactive, than, us. smarter than us you know he's the guy that's been driving this he's the one that's contacted the three of us and said did we want to do it and bring it back together and of course Nat used to present the NFL on five so we all know Matt for years and he's a top top boy um, but it's very much his team uh, Harry and Liam and all the guys that are the ones driving this and making this that's going to make this work and we're just going to uh, turn up and uh, and hopefully connect and and as a result I've started listening to a few more particularly podcasts you know like, like your good self and what i love about it is that that you know this is there's there's a big market out there there's there's plenty of room for all of us uh, and hopefully all of us doing something slightly different um and as jc rightly says you know we're just very hopeful that w we can we can fill a slot that uh, that will appeal and we can rediscover a bit of the old magic but also look to go down new avenues it's not just about recreating for the sake of nostalgia you know we do also want to do some new stuff so, uh, I mean, I'm beside myself with the excitement. I feel young again for the first time in years. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think a lot of people are looking forward to it. I mean, the, just the reaction on Twitter when it first launched. I, mean, I was like, to my partner, I was like, they're coming back. And she's like, who are? And I was like, you don't know. It doesn't matter. It's just exciting. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I, th I think, well, I, won't, I won't speak on behalf of everybody, but um, I think a lot of people are extremely excited to, to hear That's really to kind what of comes it. up. Definitely. Um, and one more thing I'd like to add as well, Matt, is that uh, since the show went off of the air, uh, you know, I was devastated, of course. Um, but I was I was lucky enough to somehow still be involved with Major League Baseball. I was able to, as a freelancer, do stuff across Europe and go to their – they open up Major League Baseball academies in certain places in Africa and in, in Spain and Germany and all that. I was able to do their media for, uh, for them. 
and I was able to get little things. Like I was able to be involved with BT Sports uh, with their coverage of the London series last year. So it was, it was good to be behind, you know, in a, in a studio gallery again, uh, behind the scenes for the London series. But I will say I would gladly trade all those things um, back and walk over broken glass barefoot just to have the, the, the old show back again. Do you know if there's any like highlight packages that existed of your uh, of the old show, like any compilations on? on uh, like apparently, media? you're not supposed to like take things away and bring them home or, or put put them on a hard drive. Is that wink, right, wink. Eric? Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd like to pick up if that's all right, Matt, on yeah. on about the whole business about when the show went off air in 2008. Uh, yeah. um, I, I I still it still brings me out in cold shivers. Um, I, I I remember it really well because in the space of three four months um the show went off air um i then lost my uh, game show that i was doing for channel five they were my two big shows at the time both lost both of them in the space of three months and i was divorced so it, it, it was a really dark time and when i got the call i'll never forget it it was i think it was, um, you could correct me eric i think i got the call on about december the 15th and it's i had mid december it's mid december and i just finished my last job of the year i just hosted an auction for uh, the cricketer Mark Rampicash, sorry, in England cricketer. And Mark uh, had gone really, really well, and the, the year was over. And it had been such a tough year, it was like, great, I'm done. I'm going to go and have a cold beer. So I was with some people, and I was feeling really upbeat. And I got a phone call, and I saw it was from the office, from Sunset and Vine. And I just immediately knew. I just, I don't know why, I just knew what I was about to be told. And I think it was Pot, Simon Potter, who was a great, great man, who was uh, one of the senior management there. And, and he just said, Gouldy, there's, there's no easy way to say this. And that was his opening line. And and, it, and the sadness for me is, you know, any show to get a 12 year run is unbelievable. You're, you're blessed. And, and Channel 5 deserve huge credit for the fact that they invested in North American sport for that long. But what, what, what pains me so much is that when Josh and I went off air in October after the World Series, we, we parted with the, with the usual words, we'll see you in April, guys. Uh, have a great Christmas. Take good care of yourselves in the off-season. We'll see you in April. And that's, that was our sign-off year after year. And that's what we did because we genuinely believed we were coming back. And then we got the announcement that they were basically ending all the late-night North American sport. And, and, and we spoke, the three of us, about how important it was to say goodbye, considering, one, we were the only show that had ever been on the channel for the full 12 years. But, two, we, we had built up this incredibly hardcore passionate following and we felt it was really important to say thank you and to say goodbye properly and we desperately tried to make that happen the three of us um and channel five wouldn't wouldn't allow it and uh, didn't agree to it wouldn't fund it and that for me is it still brings back real heartache because i and, and perhaps this is why i'm so excited about the podcast is we never got a chance to say thank you and goodbye and we desperately wanted to do that um, and now in a way, we're not going to be saying goodbye, we're going to be saying hello again, but we will be able to say thank you. And that will make this podcast very special. And I think it's important to say that, uh, you know, Johnny, Eric and I could spend hours just going down a nostalgic rabbit hole about it, because I think for all of us, it was the greatest thing we ever did and really enjoyed it. But I think that we are making, are going to make a really conscious effort with this podcast to spin things forward. Sure, we're going to give nods to the past, but really we want to do something new and fresh and not make it feel like this is just for people who are looking for like that nostalgic hit. There will be a bit of that for those people, but certainly that's not going to be the, the primary focus for what we're doing moving forward. So uh, how, how did you um, say it was quite a, a, a bad time and a dark time when it all ended? Um, how did you sort of, bring yourself back up again how did you keep yourself positive well I was really lucky buddy I mean it, it sort of was the beginning of the end for me from a TV perspective I, I think I, I did a load of shows for ESPN cricket shows up until about 213 and I was picking I think I did Chelsea TV for a couple of years all of which was great and loads of fun um, um, you and I did you and I did BBC and we did I mean yeah we did the radio together we did um, BBC five live we did the baseball show for the radio which was awesome I absolutely loved it so I, I did have some other stuff ticking along um, but you know I, I, I was in TV for 22 years I think it was and my last job was I think two, two thirteen, two fourteen, 214 and I picked up a couple of things that I did for channel 4 back in 216 217 but you know for the most part 
uh, you know, I am old and I am washed up. So therefore, you know, the, the demand for my, my involvement is, uh, is people aren't exactly knocking the door down. But I was really lucky because I, I had started up a secondary career in the corporate market, uh, hosting dinners, but in particular hosting auctions. And it, it went unbelievably well. And I've just had the most amazing time. So it was, it was never difficult for me to, uh, to, to pick up my, my, um, uh, my emotions because I was doing something again that I was having a relative level of success at and really enjoying um, getting involved with some of the top charities in the world and raising you know significant sums of money and meeting amazing people amazing people um, and all the time focusing also on being a dad to my boy who uh, who at the time was still relatively young four or five years and he's now he's actually in the next door room he's now 17 six foot four and 100 kilos of sheer muscle so uh, yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't an issue and I had the the love of, of some bloody good friends you know and we we've the big part of why we've always stayed in touch you know is uh, uh, as a as a mutual support base um so it was never a problem that it was you know i was very lucky i've been very blessed even when things went wrong they went right yeah how about yourself eric yeah well, basically yeah it is it it, it it it's still yeah like johnny it, it does resonate a little longer and uh um and same i was able i was blessed of getting some work here and there uh, as a, if, if i didn't lose the show i wouldn't have been able to do things like the olympics the beep or or, or other venues which I experimented with, but uh, like like I said before, I, I I will gladly cash it all in just to get the show back. Josh, did you um did you bounce back straight away as well? I was pretty lucky that I was able to continue doing some baseball broadcasting for a, a little while. I did some television work for the uh, World Baseball Classic Qualifier. And then Johnny and I did a season of the BBC Radio 5 Live show. And then I did, I believe, three or four more seasons with Nat. So that was really great. And I was able to be one of the two broadcasters, primary broadcasters for the, the BT event. But I did have to shift gears quite a bit because – while Johnny and Eric have better transferable skills, my ability to be a pundit about baseball, it was a little difficult to come back to the U.S. I, for, I have reasonable experience as a player. I've you know, played for Great Britain's national team, played in five European championships, uh, played professionally at the minor league level in the U.S. and in Europe. But the people who do my job in the U.S. tend to have major league experience. And even if I could be insightful and really break down certain elements of the game. It was a challenge just based on my CV. So what I ended up doing was writing a number of books and you're kind enough. I can see you on the screen here. You have one of them, my baseball in Europe book, but uh, I wrote uh, seven books over that period. I, I really sort of hunkered down and sort of went back to what, one of my first loves, baseball was always my first love, but my first sort of professional love, which was writing. Uh, and I was lucky to have some success. I had a couple of books, one book that spent a week on the New York Times bestseller list, another book that was a national public radio book of the year here in the United States. So uh, I was able to kind of pull it together. But again, it, it, it was never the same. I mean, anyone who knows me would know that I would say straight away if they asked me what just the job was that was just so much fun and the one that you love the most and cherish was doing the five shift. Buddy, you never told us about all these awards. I mean, you made us buy the damn books, but I never heard about the awards. That's awesome. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to say. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a really good read if you haven't had a chance to have a, have a go on, on Josh's books. Definitely check him out. Also, the, um, the stuff you did on Reading the Game podcast was top notch as well josh it was a really really good listen really good listen cheers thanks man best um, in the business it, are you reading the game or josh Everything. what's that <laughs> <laughs> you um, think he'd be better at fantasy baseball given how knowledgeable he is but i don't know go, kicked his ass uh, more than one occasion uh, yeah goldie yeah goldie just li li live in that little dream world it it, it's like a nice quilt. You could just Closest sort of... we can get to the real thing, mate. And if I'm humiliating <laughs> you, I don't, know, don't know how you sleep at night. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure that that won't raise its head later on either. Not if these two have anything to do with it, man. <laughs> we, we, we had the fancy baseball slot on the show, but it was literally... I had to drag it onto the lineup, kicking and screaming, because neither of them wanted it. So it was all down to me. I was the fancy baseball man. You still play fancy baseball now? 
Oh, gotcha. uh, does he play fantasy baseball? Jeez. I think I was in four leagues last year, and I'm useless in all of them, Matt. But Matt, he, he's, in, he's in four leagues. It's the classic hedge that, you know, monkeys on typewriters. <laughs> get enough typewriters, one of them's going to somehow get Shakespeare going. <laughs> yeah. hey, and I had that immortal season where I almost won both leagues. First in one and third in the other. God. Well, here's what would happen is you'd somehow luck into a good draft, and then we would all wait all season for you to muck it up. <laughs> like, because you would overanalyze, over try. Every year, right before the draft, Gould, I, I wouldn't hear for Gould for like six months. And then it would be like a week before the draft. And I would get like six messages from him. I'm like, I know he wants to talk about what he wants to do for his fantasy team. It was like all Gouldy, all fantasy all the time. What, what can I say? I assume you know what you're talking about. I want to hear your opinion. But clearly, you, you know. Clearly, I'm wrong. I'm clearly, uh, I'm egging you much too. The, 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 the primary difference between our fantasy experience is that it's not fantasy for you it becomes life for me it's like the 12th thing on my schedule you're up at like midnight trying to figure out who you can pick up and i'm like five hours later what's going on this is all my preparation here boys oh uh, see that's how old school he is mine's, mine's all spreadsheets get on the is spreadsheet it? johnny you can't beat a hard copy, Matt. You can't beat a hard copy. Hard copy. Trees. Hard copy. <laughs> hard copy. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've just taken over Dynasty team um, like last season. And I was thinking of buying baseball cards for all the players that I've got. And then I realized how deep the roster was and I don't have that much money. I was like, eh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. <laughs> maybe I won't. Hey, talking of which, I don't know how good your camera is. Have a look at that. Look at that. That's a Channel 5 baseball top trump card that Josh got made up. So I'm going to offer this to your favorite listener. They send their address and I'll post it off to them and they can put it up on their dartboard. That's a lovely <laughs> bit of kit. Yeah, maybe maybe we should have like somebody uh, like message in and say why why they should be the uh, the recipients of your... Great idea. You, you, oh, you're, you're, make, you're make, at, least, at least make them subscribe to our podcast come on buddy is that the idea of this we meant to be selling I think so. no, I yeah, think it's so. we're, we're here for something weren't we yeah. <laughs> it's what this show's all about it's about promoting the the game the sport and the people involved in it. If you I, I, I thought this was therapy stuff. matt i thought we were going through like group therapy or something <laughs> i will burn these notes after we've finished don't worry about it so. did i mention we're recording yeah we're recording <laughs> <laughs> So uh, with the with the new podcast that's coming out, what c we, we touched on it briefly uh, before, what can we expect to to, to I think I said see from the show, but what, what can we expect to hear? You've mentioned it's not going to be exactly like the old show. What are you going to bring bring to the table? Well, I, th I think the one thing I know we'll bring is is chaos. Is the only thing I think we can guarantee. It'll be total and utter chaos. I'm completely out of practice i'm rusty so i'll be messing up on a regular basis uh, eric no doubt will be disappearing to the toilet and josh will be just getting upset because no one's taking him seriously so uh, i don't know what else to offer the uh, the good i mean the, the thing is baseball keeps on evolving and, and so should we actually uh, at times but um what we like to bring new to the to, to this compared to the old shows is that it does it for itself. Like my segment, I'll, I'll talk about the, a, a brand new baseball book that's come out you know, rec book, Eric's book recommendations, for example. And I guess I'll have to plug some certain person's book as well on this. At um, least twice. Uh, yeah. But there's always, but there's always a new baseball book coming out. There's always a new baseball movie coming out. There's always a baseball reference in cultural society and, in television there's always there's always a new talking point in baseball so it's it, so the show you know scripts itself around what's new in baseball well and also when you look at the season and uh, johnny alluded to this if you listen to our trailer that's up now is that this is an unprecedented season the rules of the game in many ways are changing the way it's going to be approached is changing so i think that there's just so much new grist for the mill for us to sort of dig our teeth into mixing yeah. metaphors and um, we had, I, mean, I saw one Twitter message where somebody said, you know, will we be, will we touching on some of the, the, the old Channel 5 stuff? And as Josh quite rightly said, you know, we very much want to move forward, but without forgetting our history and without forgetting the, uh, you know, the odd nostalgic look back. And we will almost every show have a, uh, a tip a hat and do something that we did on the show. Um, whether it be something equivalent to Weaver Watch or something ex something uh, akin to that. So we'll definitely be doing that as well. But um, I think, I think the key is just, is just trying to have loads of fun and having a laugh, Matt. At the end of the day, if it's not entertaining, who wants to listen? I know I wouldn't. 
Yeah. yeah and, and at the same time, though, hopefully, fingers crossed, will be somewhat insightful about the game. I mean, certainly, I've spent so much of my life talking, playing it, and, and hopefully that will come through as well, too. Yeah. Well, that's why you're there, Josh. You wouldn't be in the Certainly long- not for the looks. <laughs> Thank God it's a podcast. <laughs> You should get all the old emails out that you never read out and do them. Well, that could be a slot. That could be our tip our hat nostalgia slot. Our uh, emails that never got read. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll have to find them. They're all in a box somewhere, in an attic somewhere. So, yeah. Why do you? I'm not sure. Uh, from a database, data protection basis, I'm not sure if I should have them. I think I probably should have destroyed them. So perhaps the less said about that, the better. And we, we should say that we will, uh, David Langal, who is as much a part of this group as, as anyone, uh, will be on as well, too. And both Johnny and I have spoken to him, and he's keen to come on. And um, we see him as as much this brotherhood as, as anyone. So. Yeah. He's family. Dysfunctional family. <laughs> Manson family. Broken family. <laughs> <laughs> have you got any plans in case the season doesn't go ahead? Oh my god! <laughs> Jinx, you just jinxed it now. Didn't you? <laughs> Sorry. Well, if I'm brutally honest, I hadn't even crossed my mind. I'm the eternal opposite, man. So I'm, I'm assuming it will. But um, no, we. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the three of us could fill an hour um, pretty much every week, anyway. Even if we're we're just talking about baseball issues, let alone baseball history. I mean, there's there's so much to to look back on. I mean, I was looking at some of the questions that you've had thrown in by your listeners. Um, you know, you know, favorite piece of baseball trivia. I mean, great idea. You could, we could talk about that for about twenty-five minutes, couldn't we, boys? So, one thing that, that, that I'll probably bring in from the old show into the podcast is my ongoing um, debate about uh, about interleague, keep it or scrap it. I remember going to a spring training, interviewing. As many managers, players, GMs, reporters, uh, broadcasters, but interly, keep or scrap it. And this is for another podcast. Where we're not going to get into the details of it. But all I'm going to say is, I can't stand interleague. I wanted to see it gone. It it, it disrupts the, the 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 separation between AL and NL. Never should the two mix until they meet the World Series. But anyways, that's one thing I'll, I will still continue as my campaign of scrap interleague. Hey, hey, Eric, spoiler alert. This season, there's going to be more interleague than ever in the it, 60 it, it, games. It's just, which is a talking point in itself. And it's Eric, what I love about you, the neutral broadcaster, is clearly the tone and the wording of your question so serving your agenda that you hated it and trying to drive everybody down that route we'll be talking about brexit next is this is what you is this where we're going with this steady podcast? steady because we don't want to go down no, no, it's be a politics free uh, zone yeah. but no, I remember it's, a, like it's even, a safe space it's, it's a safe space. space that's what we should call it the same <laughs> space and i think i remember uh, it was i think it was no more garcia Pera when i was interviewing him at um at spring training and I said, so interleague, keep it or scrap it. And then he went on this whole soliloquy about like, oh, I love interleague. And, and, he, and he was defending it and he was waxing lyrical about how amazing um, interleague was. And I just looked at him and I went, oh, come on. <laughs> it did not help my cause. You know? Just have to add a story about spring training when Eric would come and he, I would host him and we'd do spring training in Arizona. The first thing he would do because he was in America again is he would go to the local convenience store and purchase a yoo and a Twinkie, which is why he has such that beautiful physique. Breakfast of champions. <laughs> if you don't know what a yoo is, it's like this really disgusting chocolate drink. It's got vitamins and minerals in it. Don't, don't diss it. <laughs> Sounds atrocious. That's like not what chocolate should be at all. It's, 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 it's I was wondering if, if you who if, if you who are watching this maybe you know, like you know promotion you know get a case sponsorship. Yeah. We're looking for a sponsor, mate. Sponsor well, you. I've been saying let's get a Bruna Twirly Whirly since this show started, and I still haven't got any boxes of chocolate on my doorstep. So I'm long. They're, they're far too young to remember that, Matt. Twirly Whirly. Uh, twirly whirly, sorry, twirly whirly. That's probably why you haven't sent anything because no such thing as a twirly whirly. Curly whirly. Curly whirly is what I meant. <laughs> it's not um, what you meant. Yeah. Um, we, let's go back to the baseball a bit. Uh, which have been your favorite guests and which haven't guests have been the most difficult as well with it uh, throughout your, your time on the show? 
<laughs> I loved Curtis Grand. I'll start. I, I loved Curtis Granderson. We did a Granderson watch for a while, and uh, Eric and I got to spend some time with him when he came to London. He was just such a class act. Uh, nice guy, willing to give his time. Uh, you know, a great player, incredibly articulate. Uh, I mean, I you know, he just recently retired, and I think he's going to have a great post career life. But he definitely is near the top of my list. Yeah, can't agree more. Um, I mean, not that they were guests, but just for players that we met when we went on road trips and stuff. I was very fond of Trevor Hoffman. He was always really charming to us and, and very friendly. Um, Trevor and Hoffman, Bob, and of course, there was a Trevor Hoffman link with our show. Because... Well, GB Baseball. So. Yeah, GB. well, because his but, aunt's British, isn't it? Is that the link? I, I, was, I was sitting at my desk one day, it was, and I get his phone call, uh, and there's this sweet old lady on the phone she goes is this the producer of baseball and i said uh yes and she goes uh can you tell me will you be showing the all-stars game I said, the, the all-star game I, yes yes well, why she goes my my nephew is playing in that game I said, oh really and she goes yes trevor hoffman i don't know if you've ever heard of him yes i i know exactly who trevor hoffman is and she goes oh okay because maybe i can watch him play because he's sent me a message saying he'll be on the all-stars game and then that was that was my in. Every time we saw Trevor Hoffman at spring training or any event, it's like Auntie Bonnie says hello, and we uh, and he was so appreciative that we that we you know we, we'd always give a, a a nod and a hello to his Auntie Bonnie on air, yeah. who lived in Norfolk, I believe. And, and and then he would go on, as probably some of the listeners here know, to be the bullpen coach for the Great Britain national team. So he got all the more involved, probably because of that conversation Eric had with Aunt Bonnie. <laughs> it, 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 it influenced it. Yeah. <laughs> Phil Jibidus was lovely as well. Do you remember, boys? We yes. got Phil involved. What a nice Phil was, man. Phil's a huge baseball fan, huge Red Sox fan, and he was always he always loved our show and took care of us. And he did. We had the Phil Jibidus Library. Uh, he he also used to review um, a book every week on our show. He was so good at it. I remember he did them all and we had one book left and Eric, you're like, oh, Josh, why don't you try and do one? And I stunk so bad. I thought, oh, Phil did it so effortlessly. And I was just an absolute mess. And Eric, very similar to Johnny and his faxes, we never had to see that particular episode of Josh in the library because it was just god awful. <laughs> uh, I, I think it could be its own podcast and its own that, mate, if you're uh... If you're, if you're struggling for content. Yeah, yeah. There was a lovely man, Phil. Lovely man. I don't know what happened to him. Interesting, boys. You may not know this, but Asmir Begovic, the uh, the goalkeeper, played for Bournemouth and other Premier League sides. Uh, massive baseball man. Absolutely loves it. And uh, I met him, must have been five, five, maybe six years ago in an event. And we talked baseball for about an hour and a half afterwards. And what a love man and I've seen him at a few events ever since and runs his own foundation charitable foundation really dignified intelligent um, just a lovely lovely bloke so he's he's a big baseball fan so there's a few of them out there that are you know relatively famous in different worlds yeah, David Bowie had um, trout so I was talking to Harvey Soccer on the show um, yeah, he played he played in Croydon as a kid he played uh, is that right Croydon yeah. Blue Jays when he was a young, a young lad yeah He's not that. around anymore to interview, unfortunately. No, no. <laughs> Shame. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure be clambering to get on the British baseball podcast if he if he's still with us. Uh, bless him. Um, so, uh, any any players there that you you sort of wouldn't want to have back on the show? Well, we never had them on the show. They, we, you know, we, we were in, in, in a traditional sense. Um, I, I don't, don't remember ever having anybody actually in the studio that we, that we didn't like and massively buy into. Um, but we, we certainly interviewed a few when we were on the road trips that, that sort of ended up on the, uh, the, the naughty boy step. Um, I, 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 trying to think of a few off the top of my head uh JC, I, I, you... I, I, yeah i can give a few stories i think eric will remember this when we wanted to interview todd helton oh and my. Uh, we, we were down in uh, tucson rockies. arizona yeah he was with the rockies and uh we went to interview he's like now i gotta go bow hunting and we're like what what's he talking about and he basically set up i think it was like a styrofoam deer in the batting tunnel in the batting cage and he had a composite bow and he was shooting at him and it was just crazy but uh it was uh he, he wasn't the friendliest of fellows no and he and he and he just couldn't comprehend why would i want to do an interview with british television yeah 
well, yeah. well, what's in it was for it, me kind of thing. Like, well, yeah. with that in mind, was it was it Hank Blaylock? Was that the other one that we that when we were in? Um, yeah, in Texas? when he was with the Rangers. Yep. When he was with the Rangers. Oh, no offense, Matt. What a knob. He, he was not <laughs> a nice person. Not a nice person. Didn't like him at all. But, but uh, I will I will say that that was usually the exception to the rule. I think. Oh, one hundred percent. For the yeah. most part, people were very engaged and. Uh, particularly when Gould would interview him, right? He has this posh British accent and we would go to the all-star game and he would sort of weasel his way to the front uh, when they'd have these big scrums and he'd say, hello. And all of a sudden everyone would be like, who's that? And Gould would always get in a good question. Matt, Matt, it's completely true. I would just totally go into full Prince Charles mode um, and just to try and have an impact. So, you know, from Channel 5 Baseball in the UK and that, you'd see all these journos looking at you like you're some freak from out of space you know and the player would would have a focus but what, what was a bit on a bit sort of uh, uh, um, uh, unstably was the fact that more often than not I'd ask a question and and it would be a question that would they would lose their rag to Derek Jeter walked out on me um, I'm trying to think of other players that uh, that I obviously asked a question of and they they got let, really let- Larry Boa. Larry yes. Boa. Oh, that was the first 2004 the manager of the yeah. Phillies. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Oh, my God. His veins were popping out the side of his neck as a result of what I – and I never remember – I remember I sat at the front in this massive auditorium where the press, the press conference took place, and everyone was at the back. And I remember when I came in thinking – and that's really bizarre. Why are they all back there? There's all those seats at the front. And I went and sat at the front because Eric had given me such a cheap piece of camera that I had to be at the front. Otherwise, we'd never have picked up the mic. So I was right in front of him listening to these appalling questions. They would played appallingly. They would got their asses spanked. I think it was by the Rockies uh, because the night before they, the game hadn't finished till half one in the morning, extra innings. And they all just came out like they just didn't want to be there. And I remember thinking, God, if I was a, a home Philly fan, I'd have been really miffed that they didn't seem to want it more than the team that had been on the road. No matter how late they got to bed last night, so had the Rockies. And, and, and nobody was asking a question that was in the slightest bit testing. And I, eventually I put my hand up and introduced myself and just said, you know, c- could I ask a question, Mr. Bo? I mean, are you happy with the manner of the defeat? So I didn't slag them off. I didn't say anything that, you know, this is my opinion. It was awful. I just asked him. Oh my God! It, uh, it, it, I must have it just hit a nuclear button. He went ballistic, and I always remember as he's looking at me, and I'm thinking, "Hold his eye line, don't look away, don't look away." But the the overriding feel I was having was, "Have I hit the record button?" Because I couldn't look <laughs> away to see if the red light was on. Because I was thinking, "This is TV gold," and you know, is it still filming? Which thankfully it was. So uh, yeah, yeah. And I I think he, he, wa- he walked away going, "Who invited the stupid limey?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hey, I was going to ask another question. If it hadn't been for the fact that I was a guest of MLB, and I was a bit worried about getting our friend Clive, the head of MLB International, into trouble, I, I would have, I would have gone with a follow-up because his response was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous. So, well, if I was a Philly fan, uh, I would have been royally pissed. So, I don't know why you're getting angry with me. I just asked a question, blah blah blah. But no, I, I bottled it, boys. I completely bottled it. I should have asked a secondary question. What did you say to Derek Jeter that made him walk out? is the evil empire yeah i I said i said basically mr jeter in in the uk if you're not a yankees fan the yankees are known as the evil empire just wonder if you've got any thoughts on why that is he just shut down you could see the eyes just shut down he was literally as he he was being pulled away by his by what i see was his agent and he's going you calling us an evil i mean he you know mr baseball mr Carl, mr collective absolutely lost the plot and, and stormed off. And then all the journos who'd looked at me like I was a freak from outer space, then all looked at me like, what the hell were you thinking of? You know, I, I do remember feeling very lonely at that exact moment. A bit limey. <laughs> it's probably best you don't ask the first questions then in those sort of instances. Like, Absolutely. Wait, wait until Absolutely. Yeah, let, let the other journalists get their comments in first. But um, really important to say that Josh is right. The vast majority were delightful. Absolutely delightful. And really engaged with the idea that, that live baseball was being shown in the UK. What are your thoughts on baseball in Britain? Uh, we know that Josh has played. He's also in, in the Hall of Fame. Um, you said that you're you lad 17. Now, has he, has he got any um, dreams to, to test his arm or to, to give it a go? Matt, he's a, he's a, he's a rugby player and a footballer. He's, um, he goes to a school here in Bath where I live, um, a school that had an academy relationship with Bath Rugby um, and with Southampton Football Club. So the standard there is obscene. Um, I watched my son when he was under 15 and his rugby team um, were in the National Vars Schools Trophy competition. Um, and they 
played the quarterfinal uh, on the rec where Bath play. They played the semi-final at the Allianz Park, the home of the Saris, and they played the final at Twickenham. Um, and it was just and won the first ever national title that schools ever won. So he's um, he's pretty pretty tied up. He's uh, so his interest in any any other sport. And to be fair, the problem is 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 you know, and this has always been the problem. Um, it's just the, the lack of facility and the lack of opportunity. Um, but obviously for a kid that's at a school that is taking their rugby and football so seriously, and that's very much the sports that he's always played. So I think he'd try his hand at anything, but given how rubbish he is at cricket, I'm not sure he'd be particularly good. I mean, JC's the man to ask, though. I mean, in terms of the facilities and, and what's on offer um, in the world of uh, Great Britain baseball. And, and that presumably is also why baseball being lost to the Olympics in 2012 was such a disaster because yeah. they really could have built an infrastructure that could have made a real difference. Well, and, and this year too, I mean, losing the Cubs versus the Cardinals for a second London series, I think that there was certainly some momentum. The first series Definitely. went off as well as I think anyone could have hoped for and having a second one probably could have led to all the more uh, movement forward. The fact of the matter is, if you look over the long expanse of British baseball history that dates back to the 1890s, actually even before that, but 1890s when we're talking about domestic play really starting to get going, is that we've had ebbs and flows. And there have been moments where you feel like, oh, we're on the cusp, 1930s certainly, 1890s, uh, but then there's sort of, a, a, it recedes. And the hope is, uh, and there's another issue, which is that the hope now is that we're moving forward. We certainly have a great facility at Farnham Park near Slough. Uh, there's efforts to build a similar facility in, in the greater Manchester area, which I'm sure you're aware of, Matt. Um, and those facilities really make a difference because it entices people who want to play the sport to play uh, on a pitch that is worthy of playing on. It's really difficult for so many players to play on these fields that undulate and you don't get true hops. So that's great. I think you also have a second community that's really burgeoning in the UK, which are the fans. I mean, we see so many podcasts, so many team communities that are developing and really thriving. And the hope is, is that the two will meet, that you're going to get the players, continuing to grow and these fans continuing to sort of help prop up those players who are growing because I think it's important for the game to succeed as a playing sport on British soil as much as it is for there to be a great number of fans who watch the game of overseas. Yeah. Do you think at any point in all the research that you've done within British baseball, do you think there was ever a point in time where baseball in Britain could have been taken to the next level and then become as, not maybe as big as something like rugby union or or rugby league, but to those sort of levels? Certainly in the 1930s, there was a tremendous amount of hope. They were having games in large venues, everything from the old White City uh, Stadium to horse, uh, excuse me, dog tracks primarily throughout the country. And you could get two, 3,000 people out for games, which is a tremendous amount of people. I think that if all of that had have happened today, maybe there would actually be even more of a chance to move forward. I think what was working against the sport then was the fact that there was such a protective nature to the big three, to, to football, rugby, and cricket, that I think that there was a, a sort of a cultural pushback. I think there'd be less of a cultural pushback now, but of course we have a far more crowded sporting landscape. So it's going to be difficult anytime, but what really was going on then along with the number of people was that there was a great financial support for the sport. John Moores, who uh, created the Littlewoods pools, uh, you know, was very involved in Everton football. He played such a huge role in trying to push the game forward during that period. And if you could get a benefactor of that level today, I do believe the sky is the limit. Yeah. Well, I keep playing the Euro millions each week. <laughs> <laughs> You never know. I'm still trying to find someone to buy me that farmhouse where I lived, so I can do the Field of Dreams in Manchester. But again, no one's no one's taken. But if you can't get someone like Curly Whirly involved, I'm going to get a multi millionaire. <laughs> you who as well, yeah. <laughs> you who, yeah. Uh, Johnny and Eric, have you got any plans to see any British baseball uh, when the season gets up and running uh, in your local areas? Well, I'm usually involved with with, uh, with BS UK, British Softball UK, and I do frequent uh, Farnham Fields and Slough. Um, often, and and that's the irony, right? This usually when you go in April to Slough, 
uh, April in the UK is never nice. It's, it's always miserable to trying to get, you know, uh, motivated to get kids to play baseball in the cold, in the rain, in slough. It's not easy. And what happens this year? This year it was the, was the best April and May on record. Every day was baseball weather and no one could play. Uh, it was a shame. So this is the first year I have not gone to Flower Farnham for any event or help out uh, BSUK in any form. Do, do you know, Eric, from, you know, those that are involved, the sort of John Boyd's of this world, you know, how they're approaching the, the, the lockdown and whether they're going to be uh, able to get any recreational baseball? Josh knows it more uh, as yeah, well. Yeah, they're, they're, they're planning on doing an open tournament, so which is very exciting. Uh, something they used to have, sort of like a nationwide knockout tournament. One of the issues with British baseball Balls, it gets very regionalized. This has happened a number of times. And we've seen the National Baseball League is really very much in the South. there have been a Northern Baseball League, a, a Southeast League. Um, so they've all sort of, sort of split off in a certain way. But having a national tournament where you can have all these teams coming together, I actually think it's very exciting. I think it's a really great opportunity. And obviously health permitting, it could be something that could be really good for the sport. And I assume that's at Farnham, is it? I think they're going to be regionalized. I think maybe yeah. the finals are going to be in Farnham. Matt, you, right. you shaking your head as if you know. Yeah, it, it, it sounds pretty much like from what I've seen so far on readers, it, it's, it is a bit up in the airish, but yeah, it, it does seem like it's going to be a regionalized thing with a, with a finals in, in Farnham. But it should be exciting, though. It's, it's a chance to play baseball. Um, and to I remember when I first got the show, taking, um, taking my then family and young kids down to Brighton. Uh, yeah, for the, for the finals. Yeah, there'd be a lot of there'd be, there'd a, lot be of a good turnout. Yeah. yeah, and it was a decent turnout. And I remember doing. Um, I had to. We had to sing uh, "Take Me Out to the Bullpark" with Mike Carlson. Mike and I. <laughs> thank God he knew the words because I didn't. <laughs> The, the, the idea of, of sort of reuniting all the different regions of British baseball is very exciting to me. I remember in 2007, I played in the last national championship that had representatives from the North and the South. So there was uh, Liverpool and there was Menwith Hill and then uh, we made it uh, and one other team from the South. And it was just so great to have teams from across the country playing against each other. I would love to see that happen again on a regular basis. JC, was, was that the year that it was torrential? And I don't know how they got the games finished. Was that that year? That was, was 2008. Came... That was the following right. year. Because that was, I came down for that. And I mean, I remember watching you guys, literally you were going out the bat with your, your arm, you, you know, your, your swimming armbands on. I mean, it was unbelievable. I don't know how they got those games. But you, you know what? Now thinking about it, though, 2008 also had both North and South too. So I think actually that must have been the last year. I was thinking about 2007 because it was the last year I pitched in, a, <laughs> in any sort of reasonable manner. But 2008 also had a split. So I think that was actually the last year, Goldie. So I think you're, you're spot on. Awesome. And just before we move on to listen to questions, uh, what are your favorite baseball and non-baseball memories surrounding your time on the MLB on five? Um, I, I, I hate to admit it, that if I go first, I think the dizzy bat race when we were on that, uh, our last and final road trip in 2008. And that was, we'd had so many amazing experiences, but when we, um, when we, we got invited into, you know, what was then minor league baseball stadium, I think there was about 5,000 people there. And the man that ran it, who was a friend of Clive's just rolled out the red carpet and there was, they couldn't do enough for us. You know, we, we took batting practice with the guys. We sat in the dugout, Josh got to be a, a ball boy and I got to throw out the ceremonial first pitch and, I mean, we just had a ball. We sat out in different parts of the stadium. We chatted with everybody. We got invited down to take part in the Dizzy Bat race in the middle of the seventh. And, you know, we then ended up in the radio booth and it went to extra innings. So we were in there for about four extra innings, if I remember rightly. I mean, it was just, it was a truly magical day. How many people that love something, love a sport, get to live that dream to the extent that we did on every single level? I mean, I don't know about you, JC, but I think probably that was the, the true highlight of, in what was a sea of highlights in, in 12 years of doing the show I'll, I'll never forget that that was so yeah I, I certainly agree Johnny that particular game but those road trips in general were all just so exciting but I for me on a personal level the all-star games were great because Johnny and I on the day of the all-star game we get to go down and take batting practice and I as a player got to play in the kingdom when the Seattle Mariners played there uh, while I was still playing at a you know, serious level, but to get to take batting practice at PNC Park, old Yankee Stadium, uh, got to play at AT&T, 
uh, Oracle Park, whatever the heck it's called now. And uh, I think I also got at Dodger Stadium and another experience to take batting practice in all these amazing baseball cathedrals. That was just such a thrill for me. Yeah. Which of the teams that you've visited in all your travels do you say looks after you the best? Well, sadly, the one that lived up to its reputation was um, was the New worst. York. Was the worst. Yeah. I mean, yeah. amazing yeah. stadium, but in terms of the the people there, I mean, it was. I mean, you know, we were treated so well. I mean, I remember the Mariners were lovely, absolutely lovely. Uh, but then most of them were. I mean, I loved the Angels; they were fantastic. I loved uh, Camden, uh, going to Baltimore. That was amazing. Um, yeah, we we were very blessed. It was very rare that we went somewhere and weren't weren't treated really really well. And and we you know we had passes to everything. We were in the dugouts. We were you know uh, we, we we were pretty much allowed everywhere. And if we weren't allowed there, we went there anyway. Um, and uh, you know I think probably the only one where I felt like we were a bit of an inconvenience was was that All Star game in in New York in two thousand and eight. And it was such an iconic stadium that I don't regret us going. But I do remember thinking. Hmm, you know they've they've got a bit of a reputation for arrogance, and it seems like it's slightly it's it's a bit justified. They, it, you know, we we just came across as an inconvenience to them, which I thought was really really sad. Uh, but that was a rare experience, wasn't it, boys? Can you think of anywhere else that we felt that way? Because I can't. No, that was definitely the one that stood out. Obviously, the best I think was Round Rock, but that was minor leagues because uh, we had sort of a direct connection. But Wrigley I, was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, I, mean, that, I, I, I agree with you. Like, I mean, all the other teams really rolled out the red carpet for us. We were always – Texas, they were really nice. I mean, we went – Rangers, we had, we, had, we had friends at yeah. Texas Rangers, yeah. 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 Uh, but, but, yeah, also, the, the Yankees were the only ones who – For me, uh, spring training-wise, uh, my, my favorite team, and always uh, and to the point where I even got a soft spot for them, that gave me full access. Give me anything. It's one of those, like – you know, what time does your game start? And what time can you get here? You know, the, the, was the Oakland A's? Is the Oakland A's still? They're, they, they're just, uh, I, guess, I guess, they remind me of Channel 5. They got rough edges. They're, they're like a mom and pop shop. Um, and you, you just, we had full access to spring training, full access. Uh, when I, when interviewing Billy Bean, I remember like uh, we, we chatted on, with him at the, by the Oakland A's dugout uh, when, I was, when I went to Oakland for, uh, for a feature on Moneyball. And we, discussed Moneyball for about 15 minutes. And then he sat down with me and my Brazilian cameraman because the, the World the World Cup was coming up. And he, we sat down like three guys in a pub in the dugout ch- chatting football. I mean, who do you think is going to the World Cup? You know, and, and, and he knew his stuff about football. And, and for me, the Oakland A's, you know, they were just like more than happy to for me to come anytime with, without a pass. Or, and so kudos to the Oakland A's. And now you know you know, why, why you've got Brad Pitt pretending to be him, you know, because he's such a superstar. You know, if they made a movie about us, I'd hate to think who they'd cast. I'd probably have worse. Yeah, Marty comments. Feldman's already dead, I'm afraid. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'd be one of the hobbits, right? <laughs> swarthy, very swarthy. <laughs> I'm thinking Jim Belushi for you, Eric. Well, okay, well, I'll, take, I'll, good, take yeah. I'll take that. I'll take that. Well, I would say John, but sadly he's no longer with us. But. I think Elijah Wood would, would, uh, would be up for that. Is he up for, up for some indie projects? <laughs> you should reach out and see. Yeah, one of those minor appealing movies that gets shown in those really small theatres. <laughs> <laughs> Pay per view that no one pays for. <laughs> yeah. Just us. <laughs> for, for view. We just call it for view. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, I think we'll now move on to some of our listener questions. Uh, we, we had uh, well quite a, a large response off the bat of the announcement of the show coming on. So it's, uh, I did send you these in advance to hopefully um, give you a bit of an idea of what's coming your way. And I'd like to say as well that um, the gentlemen have agreed to um, not like a competition to sort of whichever the to two questions that they like the best. Um, Joel from um, Four Bases uh, has agreed to to give away uh, two copies of his publication to the to the best questions um, and the proceeds of those are going towards charity so even if you don't win there's still opportunities to to get hold of a copy of his of his book it's in pdf format at the moment because it's sold out and look at look for joel on four bases on twitter and all the links are in there too so we'll start off with with charlie bay though who is a player for the um sheffield Bruins. He says, how do you think baseball in Britain should progress? Josh. 
Yeah, uh, I think, you know, there are a lot of really great people in both the GV setup, folks like Liam Carroll and Will Lintern, and, you know, on the more sort of administrative side, people like John Boyd, who uh, care deeply about the development of the sport. I am a firm believer, and this is a paraphrase, if you build it, they will come, uh, that really an emphasis on facilities are essential. The more fine pitches that you have in the UK, I think the more players you're going to get. And what you really need are a way to attract the best athletes. And that's what we've seen throughout all of Europe. The places in Europe where baseball has grown the most are places where you can get the top athletes. The highest ever signing bonus for a European player was a player by the name of Martin Gasparini, who uh, was from Italy. Martin was an amazing athlete and he chose baseball over football, which he could have easily played in a couple of other sports where he could have been high class, but he chose that. And we need to get our British athletes to look at baseball as an opportunity in the same way. Yeah. There's, there's a little all-star game hopefully taking place as well. The MLB guys that Max Whittle's been, been arranging, I think they're playing the London team. So uh, I think it's Mika Richards who used to play for Man City and Aston Villa is going to be playing that. So if he gets transferable skills, if he still is in Manchester, I'll try and poach him back. Well, it's fascinating. You know, a number of years ago, uh, John and I were both involved. Marcus Triscothic as part of his, uh, his final year, uh, his tribute year. He put together a, a baseball game against the GB national team, which I had the opportunity to play. And it was a pretty good side of cricketers. Wouldn't you agree, Johnny? I mean, actually, Giles was on that yeah, team. Yeah, Garen Jones. You know, some of the 2005 Ashes boys were all there. Um, and they were still relatively in their prime. This was 2007, 2008, something like that. Yeah, because JC, uh, that w was his testimonial year. It wasn't his yeah, final sorry. year, but it was his sorry. testimonial year, which he awarded after 10 years with the county, which right. was some, you know, Somerset legend. Uh, I think he's still playing. If he, if, he, if he isn't, he's literally just quit in the last year. I think he may have just quit last season. So, I mean, th th that's how long he, what a legend he is. It was an interesting game because we won by a vastly large margin. And it's a reminder that baseball is a real skill specific game. I mean, cricket obviously has a lot of overlap with baseball, but it requires really good coaching. And that's why I sort of speak to the coaches that they have in Great Britain right now. Uh, you just need a ton of them also at the club level, guys like Drew Spencer with the London Mets, who really know the game and can teach it because Yes, you need the athletes, but also you need to have the coaching to be able to fine tune those skills for. But buddy, if you remember, because I do remember this well, because I was doing all the uh, the the, com the um, you know commentary while you were playing, the the English boys, the, the the Somerset cricketers, were meant to have some coaching from you, British baseball boys. I think they had like two three sessions set up, and I don't think any of them happened. So I don't think they took it seriously enough, and then they got their asses spanked. And being you know top level professional sportsman i know for a fact because i'm i've been working for ashley for 10 years and his lovely wife stina um so i know ash really really well and he said they they were hurting they hated the fact that you absolutely came them and but at the end of the day they only had themselves to blame because they didn't take the tuition that they needed and they clearly needed yeah awesome uh, john mckellar of the ball cats and bagpipes podcast up in scotland has asked have either of you uh, experienced baseball in scotland and if so what are your memories of it I, uh, I went up and did a, a event in Paisley uh, one time uh, many years ago, and it was a great experience. I mean, I love the Scottish people. I don't even think Johnny and, and Eric know this, but I, I own a flat in Perth, uh, Scott. Oh, yeah, you told me, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I never knew that. So, uh, you know, I, I, love, I love that part of the country. Uh, you know, as if and when I get to spend more time there, hopefully I can be involved with baseball. But I've interacted with a lot of people who play baseball there. And, and you know, I really respect and appreciate uh, the efforts there. I, I have a very limited experience of baseball in Scotland. Uh, the only thing that I can tell you about is that my girlfriend, Louise, is Scottish. And I went up there and she clouted me around the head with a baseball bat once. And that's, that's pretty much full experience i'm afraid great form though right technique was perfect i tell you that girl <laughs> great <didn't> finish <laughs> i got a, got a lot great launch angle on your skull <laughs> just think i just realized i just said that girl can swing that's possibly not what i meant but there you go yeah. <laughs> hopefully she's not listening <laughs> love you baby <laughs> uh, eric you had any experience up in scotland well funny enough uh, doing the baseball off season uh every year i have to go up to scotland and work on the BBC Scotland coverage of curling. 
Yay. Yes, that's right. I'm the, I'm the uh, by default because I'm Canadian, and uh, apparently I was the only one in the in London who knew the rules, let alone even watched it once. Uh, compared to my other colleagues, they made me they make me go up to Perth, of of all places, uh, to uh, to help produce the, um, the 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 curling cover. So I know all the curlers in Scotland, but I don't okay. actually. But I do get people who come to watch the curling who say. You're the guy for the baseball. I say, yes, I am. Did you stay in Josh's flat? Well, no, 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 no. I will now. For, I will you from will, now on. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll trash the place too. So. It's, it, it's not a coincidence that uh, Eric was in Perth and that I've purchased it. That is the home of the World Curling Federation, a sport that I uh, now compete in at a reasonably serious level. That's right. He's Josh, is, Josh is now, he, yes, he's better at baseball than me. Now he's better at curling than me, but I'll just stick on the uh, behind the camera side. Yeah, I think this was actually asked a question about curling as well, so we'll get to that in a little while. Uh, I love Perthshire as well. I got lost near the, um, the, the mystical forest or the magical forest around there. Nightmare. Sat now, don't believe that place exists, but it's a beautiful part of the world. It really is. Yeah. yeah. You got to yeah. you got to stop eating mushrooms, Matt. That's the problem. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like mushrooms. Eat fried haggis. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Fun enough to do that in Salford. Um, it's it's just great. It's just loads of batter. Not much. Uh, <laughs> not much anything else. It's staple diet around there. Um, David Hayes uh, from off of Twitter, uh, Hayes Unit, would like to say, with so many excellent podcasts out there. How will your show stand out from the rest? Probably by its lack of professionalism. Um, Just look at us. Excessive enthusiasm. Um, good hygiene. Good. <laughs> Maybe not stand out. <laughs> High cholesterol count. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, um, I, you know, we're very lucky that we, 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 we obviously have... Um, there's a recognition factor from what we did with channel five. Um, so there's a, a lot of people out there that obviously hopefully will tune in for that reason. If that reason only, um, we're incredibly lucky that we are best mates and therefore the chemistry is, is good. Um, we've, we've obviously had extensive broadcasting experience, which, which will be relevant to, to any kind of podcast, which at the end of the day is just another form of broadcasting. Um, and thank God for Eric and I, we've got somebody who actually knows the baseball inside out. So when it's all going tits up, we'll just throw to Josh. <laughs> <laughs> and when are you expecting the podcast to be launched? I think the next boys, you might, it's this, yeah, 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 it's um, July the nineteenth. I think it is, isn't it? Next weekend. Yeah. a week to today. Uh, well, sorry, what, what day is this? Uh, tomorrow. It'll be next, it'll it'll be tomorrow. Be July nineteenth. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Right. So put date in your calendar, people. Um, Ian Bleasty, Liverpool Trojans general manager. What's your favourite game uh, on the broadcast that you did? And Ooh. did you expect? Oh, oh yeah, he sent two questions in. Yeah. I, I, well, boys, I always think I'm. I think I always remember my favourite game was the um, um, was the D backs game seven. It was the Yankees, I think, wasn't it? When, That's right. Um, um, with Gonzalez, Randy Johnson. You got uh, Kurt Schilling with the, the blood in the sock. I mean, it was just it was such a thriller. It was such, do you remember that? I mean, everybody said it was the Yankees to lose and. I mean, I, I just remember it was just edge of the seat stuff. So I've always remembered that one. It was, it was always, it's also, it's like that film script. It's, it's, the, it's the last game, seventh game in the World Series. And, you know, it's that sort of, oh, if they wrote this in a movie, no one would believe it. But uh, uh, it was pretty special. I mean, we saw a lot so, of... So, wait, wait, let's, let's, let's clarify here, Goldie. You said Randy Johnson and the D-backs first, and then you talked about a bloody sock. And I was just going to say. Socks. So you've now conflated two games in your magical mystery of baseball world. Three years apart. Three years apart. My God. Well, the I soccer you know, all that. <laughs> yeah. Am I getting I, confused there? I, because, I, hang on, because they, they had the ultimate um, double bill in terms of their, their Yeah, spot. that was 2001. 2001. That was 2001. That, that which was, was great. That was the Yankees. I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that was the one. But I'm then Kurt Schilling, well, that wasn't the, sock, the, the, the bloody sock, sock is, is, is 2004. Okay. That, to me, uh, game four of the World Series in 2004 was uh, my highlight. I did some broadcasting for Channel 5 before the game and uh, got to interview Johnny Damon right before the game to do some bits for Channel 5. But then I broadcasted it for BBC Radio 5 Live with Simon Brotherton. So rather than doing the studio show that Johnny and I did, because uh, David was, was doing it at the time, David Langell, uh, I did the actual uh, summarizing with um, 
with Simon Brotherton. And I grew up a huge Red Sox fan, in particular in the 80s, where with the exception of uh, their heartbreak 1986 loss to the Mets, they were a very mediocre team. Uh, you know, the 90s were very forgettable for the Red Sox. And of course, anyone who's a baseball fan knows about the curse of the Bambino. So to be able to be on the radio live when the Red Sox broke the curse, uh, it was a lifetime achievement. Uh, and to be doing it in that format too, where you're part of the actual play-by-play -play, uh, was all the more exciting for me. Eric, any of your favorite memories? Uh, it's funny, the, the one memory I have of a, a crazy game that we broadcasted, uh, people still, uh, it, it was, it was a, it was a mid August game is between the Cleveland Indians and the Seattle Mariners. Nothing really to play for. There wasn't really any playoff implications like uh, that, that followed it or anything, but it was one of those games that we, I don't know if it, it was the top of the eighth and it was something like ridiculous. It was, uh, it was Seattle leading like 15 to two. And I remember thinking, okay, this game's over. And, and by the bottom of the ninth, we're already calling our cabs. Uh, we worked with those, our assistants already booking cabs for us because we're going to go off air pretty soon within one inning. And next thing you know, the cabs are outside at, at top of the ninth inning and um, it's 15 to 10. And somehow it went to extra innings and somehow Kenny Lofton uh, slid into home, end the game. And it was the most thrilling non-event game that, that that was originally tipped that I think we ever broadcasted. And people were still talking about it for days afterwards. People who shut down after the eighth inning said, ah, oh, this game's done. They, they saw the highlights the next day and said, oh my God, I can't believe I turned it off at that point. That, that reminds me actually of the 2002 World Series in game six between the Angels and the Giants. And the Giants were winning by a large sum, so much so we thought it was going to be the end of the World Series. And I can neither confirm nor deny, but we might have had a few sips of some lager, uh, you know, because we thought it was the end of the season and we were right near the end. And then all of a sudden the Angels came back, they won that game, and then we had a whole other, you know, game seven uh, in 2002. Sounds awesome. I think we were a bit worse for wear, weren't we, towards the end of that? So if I remember, perhaps, I think we perhaps. may have had a couple of early sherbets, perhaps a little bit uh, premature. Not that it, it made any difference to the total lack of professionalism anyway. I, I, think, I think it elevated our performance, Goldie. <laughs> Not exactly difficult. Good question, yeah. though. like that one. Yeah, he also asked, uh, did you expect to find much camaraderie with the UK baseball fan base, and what does it mean to you to still be remembered so fondly? Well, I've just had a career of failure, so to have something that's deemed a success and to to, uh, to still to this day meet people ten years after, let alone the children of viewers, um, I just I just feel blessed to be honest. Um, in terms of what it means, it, as the boys have said, um, no matter you know, I mean, thankfully, uh, you know, m my career hasn't exactly been the most successful, but I, I look back on it and uh, and I do truly believe. Um, that uh, there are very, very few people in my line of work that can look back with such amazing uh, affection and fondness for an experience and, uh, and to still have people coming up now all these years later. How, how often have I gone and refilled my car with petrol and this poor, some lonely soul who's sitting there watching some rubbish on the TV and immediately strikes up a conversation about the great old days when he used to sit there through the night um, taking people's money, watching the baseball. It's great. Fantastic. Amazing. Uh, what always comes to mind is what an honor it was for me. I know that uh, both Johnny and Eric did interact with the greater uh, community out in the field, but I played baseball in the domestic league for better part of six seasons. And so, and there were a lot of good players who I played with, a lot of smart baseball people, but to be the one who got to go on TV and talk about the game to the broader community, it was just such an honor to, to be chosen to be that person, to be the player who speaks on behalf of the game. Uh, I considered it not only an honor, but a responsibility too. And I always tried to be prepared as a result and never talk down to the audience, uh, but offer whatever wisdom and knowledge I had about the game. And uh, again, it was just an honor to be that, that guy. Yeah. Eric? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, for me, it was, it was not just an honor, but it was, it was humbling, actually humbling. It's just, you know, to be recognized and to be thanked. Uh, but but I, at any time I'll go to a baseball event in Slough or Farnham and, and people would come up to me and say, would you sign my baseball? I said, I, said, I can't do that because I'll devalue your baseball if I sign it. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, and but they but they insist on it, and, and it's very humbling. And I and I and I and I thank every single one of them that that, that do approach me and say thanks for the programming. I, I told this story uh, somewhat recently when uh, Goldie and I were uh, talking with another uh, podcaster, but I think it's worth repeating and just speaking to how important our show was to some people. I, when I was broadcasting for BT Sport, the uh, London series, a woman came up to me and asked to take a picture. I said, great. And so we were taking the picture. She said, my dad who's passed away would have been really pleased to have seen this picture. And I, I don't think there was any moment that's ever touched me more than that in my professional uh, career, just that we mattered to people out there on some level. Uh, it just, like Eric said, it's humbling. Uh, you know, we're just three schlubs, you know, just three guys trying to get through this world and that we could mean something to anyone in any manner other than our family is just uh, beyond expectation, I think, for any of us. Yeah, great answer. Lovely. Uh, Joel from Four Bases um, has said, how does the sport grow in the UK from where we are now? Sport's main channel of growth, in his opinion, uh, are people who run the fan accounts on Twitter and create a UK MLB community. The NFL has NFL UK, which drives the international series and events. So how does baseball in the UK get into that? I mean, my, my view on it is that um, having, having a UK presence on TV, I mean, BT Sport do a great job with showing loads and loads of baseball. Um, if you have the ESPN BT Sport channel, but there's no UK flavour on it, and and I do think that you know indicative of what we've been talking about and 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 why the the, the show still to this day resonates is that it was a, a product that people love and are passionate about and want to watch, but they want it from their unique perspective, a UK perspective. So I do think that having that is really is is vital if that's a, a way forward. I'm a great believer. Listening to what Josh said, if if you build, they will come. So there has to be the financial investment. Where does that come from? And to be honest, also unless you can get kids playing baseball in school and even and, and I know that there's quite a lot of softball that goes on which is a great start just swinging a bat and, and loving it and enjoying it um, you know th th that's where it all starts if, if you can get kids playing um, and playing at that sort of absolute grassroots level but that does require investments it requires it requires the facilities it requires coaches that are dedicated enough to spend weekends I mean I've spent the last since the the um, the show uh, went off air I've spent the last 12 years um, coaching my son's rugby club and um, you know it's that sort of involvement um, that, that that brings kids to a sport that they go down every Sunday and and there's some amazing people out there that are just giving up so much of their time to do exactly that but without the financial support without the other backing and, and without the sort of real tr central drive to get the sport into the schools you know I, I think it's a it's always going to be a massively uphill struggle um, do and you know, you just got to hope that, as, as Josh quite rightly said, one, you need a major financial backer. Two, maybe, you know, MLB to take a different approach to what they're trying to do in terms of Europe, in terms of their investment. But it is, you know, it's a lot of money in a world where money is short at the moment. So just to add one quick thing to what Johnny was saying, I think that being on Freeview is huge for the game. Because if you love baseball, you can go on to MLB TV, you can spend the dosh to watch it on BT. But what you need is an opportunity for people to happen upon baseball who aren't already fans. And that was what our show offered, which was you come up from the pub, you're a little tipsy, you turn on the television, and you're mesmerized by this game that you may not have seen before and you get hooked and that is such an essential piece is give, giving a, a taste of it to people a, a free taste uh in order to get them interested for the long haul yeah 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 uh, eric anything else i'd add to that no the guys said it eloquently more than i ever could <laughs> yeah do you think that the uh, london series will come back next year with it being cancelled this year or do you think it'll move on to to somewhere else have you uh, I've not heard anything. I don't know if you have, Josh, but I would. I'd be. I can't believe they wouldn't want to bring it back, given the success of last year. I, I think there's just so much up in the air right now. I can't imagine that this is high on their agenda of to do issues when they're trying to get off a, a season under these circumstances. So my guess is that it's something that they'll address at a later point. Yeah. But they can't wait too long, obviously, because even though they probably have a sense of how to do it, uh, they probably have to get quite a bit in place to make it happen. Yeah, it's a uh, shame because it's because uh, I, I I can't foresee, and this is only my own opinion. I, I don't want to 
jinxed it as well. But I, I can't foresee even London Series 2021 happening at this juncture. But you never know. You've always been a pessimist. Oh, no, not I. <laughs> That's why you're a West Ham fan. <laughs> uh, Cam from the Ministry of Baseball. Uh, he said he was born post-Channel 5 era. So in order to get him and others of the younger generation feed, his question is, pitch the show to the listeners, Dragon Den style, the brief history and what were the ambitions and the successes? I think that's referring back to the MLB on five. Pitch it Dragon's Den style. Hmm. Wow. His question, not mine. <laughs> If you could see Johnny's Hawaiian brave, Hawaiian style brave shirt right now, you would put down your money immediately. I gotta say, <laughs> I could see, I could hear Peter Jones. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even made my pitch. What are you saying? Yeah. yeah. Hey, at the end of the day, um, if you truly love baseball, then you know you can't get enough of it, whether it be watching games or or listening to podcasts and uh, we are guaranteed that we're going to have loads of fun we're going to have loads of laughs we're going to tip our hats to the past uh, but at the end of the day we've got the best pundit in uh, in baseball and I and I consider that to be not just in the UK but in the US as well uh, a man who can translate the the intricacies of the game to the idiots like me and to the purists and the and the well informed um, and, and and educate in the process as well as entertain education and entertainment with a double E's Sounds like a bra. There you go. That's my pitch. <laughs> yeah, the producer of the show, would, would you like to weigh in on, on any of that? Yeah, actually, uh, I would actually, because um, I, I th it is a tricky one. It's always been a tricky one trying to convert preaching the gospel of baseball to those who don't know anything about it or those it's not part of their social fabric or upbringing. Uh, but I like to think that we've actually – already started a uh, little bit of a social fabric. Yes, there are people who were born uh, who are 10 years old and went off here who probably didn't watch us. We're now 20, 22, 20 and, and ongoing. Uh, but if you know, if you want, if, if you want to be well informed and, and we will guarantee that we will be entertaining as well as informative, as well as we shall guarantee some pretty kick-ass guests in the future. Uh, and I just put, I, and, uh, I know I just, uh, I just committed myself there, didn't I? Uh, but also, if you if you want to know which book to read, which film to watch, which hot dog to avoid in Major League Baseball at out of the 30 stadiums, you talk to us. Josh, anything to add on top of that? Just the game has changed a lot in the last 12 years. And I think that's what's so exciting to me is to pick up that slack. I mean, whether it's uh, the way analytics are approached, uh, the way teams have chosen to work their bullpen, uh, which will change this year yet again, uh, or their starting rotations. I mean, there's no such thing as an opener. No one talked about launch angle. The game or spin rate and all these different facets of the game, I think, are going to be very exciting, not only for the old, but for people who are now new to the game and want to understand it in a more holistic sense, you know, to understand – what what's it like to have the dirt between your teeth when you're digging in to, you know, having a bat and also what it means to, you know, try and throw a backdoor slider. So hopefully that's what I can bring to the table. Okay. Uh, Molly from Bristol baseball. She's on the directors there. She's asked, what are your thoughts surrounding women's baseball? Cause the GB team has just been announced. And also what makes now the right time to bring your podcast out? Well, I'll, I'll talk to the first bit and I'll let either Johnny or Eric talk to about the timing, but I can't tell you how excited I am that uh, GB has chosen to start a, a woman's program. I seriously, I tip my hat to the people who are putting that together and I am just so thrilled because there's this very incorrect assumption that, uh, you know, the woman's sport is fast pitch softball and the men's sport is baseball. It doesn't have to be that way. Historically, there are great precedents going back to the start of the 20th century of incredible Babe Diedrichson playing baseball. Uh, and that there is an infrastructure worldwide for women's baseball, but I do feel that Great Britain is enough of an early adopter here that they can really make a mark in this 
area of baseball. And I'm so excited to see how it will play out. I'm so excited. And I will be a huge fan for, for both the domestic women's baseball program and also uh, at the national level. Yeah. Some of the players that are involved in it that I've spoken to passion. It's amazing. And I'm, like you said, it's really exciting time. Really exciting time. And, all, and to be honest, Matt, all I want to add to that is, I mean, it's the perfect timing for it, isn't it? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, women's sports going through the long overdue revolution uh, in this country and, and across the world. And why should baseball not be a part of that process? I mean, it's an absolute nonsense to think otherwise. So, uh, and I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to hear that Molly is a local to me because I live in Bath and she's just down the road in Bristol. So there's something that I could definitely check out. So now we're 100% behind it. Um, and obviously we'll be looking to people like Molly to, to keep us well informed. I like to, I like to echo the praise for the women's uh, program here in the, in GB. Uh, I've worked closely with them in the past and, and they don't get enough credit or they don't get enough exposure that they, some, some of these GB women go on to NCAA, they get accepted to universities and colleges and, and, uh, and they dominate in Europe. They've had some very successful tournaments in the, in the past few years. And uh, it just, unfortunately, they're, they're not getting the exposure that's required of them, and hopefully we can help out with that. Well, that, that, of course, is fast pitch softball, and I think that that will continue to be, you know, a very vibrant part of the overall setup. But playing hardball as well, too, that that opportunity is there. I had a really good friend uh, growing up who was a softball player, um, a female softball player who always lamented that just her opportunities for baseball dried up at a, a too young an age. And she was right. It, and it was inappropriate. And I'm really happy that we're seeing a change uh, from that front. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, Adam, um, Adam underscore G underscore W. Uh, question for Josh. Is there currently a cap on the number of overseas players that can play for Team GB? And if not, are you in favor of one in order to give more homegrown kids the chance to represent their country even if it means not playing to a higher standard? Uh, this is one of the biggest questions that has surrounded the Great Britain national team since I first played for it in 1996. And it's one that actually isn't just GB related, it really applies to all of Europe. There is no cap on people like me who are passport holders. You have to have a passport. We're passport holders, but maybe didn't learn their baseball in Great Britain. It's certainly a balancing act because on the one hand, you want to place the best British team you can possibly place in international competition. On the other hand, you need to give avenues for young born and bred British players to develop and get better. And so I do believe that you need to find a balance. I can't tell you what exactly that is, but it's been a hard one. When I first played for GB in 96, I was one of only two players who were like me. The whole rest of the team, the other 18 players or however many they were, were all born and bred. By the time I played on the national team the last time in 2005, the vast majority were people like me. And when you look at things like the World Baseball Classic, we have weighed very heavily in the direction of people who have passports who have played elsewhere. And perhaps for the major events, that's okay. I think one of the ways in which the GB setup is trying to kind of bridge that gap are like under 23 teams, where really the effort is to put the emphasis on local players to get to play there so that you're playing at a reasonable international grade, but still leaving your top senior team to have just the best players possible. So I think an answer of having many different age group teams is, is a huge part of that. Yeah, I've had quite a lot of the, the GB guys on, uh, Liam, um, A-Rod and Jonathan and Drew, and all of them are, are doing like, if you should go back and listen to some of those episodes uh, if if you want to see what they're trying to do within the local communities and, and trying to get baseball grown as well. It's uh, something that they're very passionate about. Just to add on that too, I think one of the really great elements about the national setup right now is that people like Liam Carroll, like Will Linterm, like Jonathan Crammond, all are British born and bred and they're running the program. When I first started, there were a lot of import coaches. So the national team coach was a guy named Ralph Rago who had coached at UC Davis in the U.S. Uh, Stefan Rapalia, who's a great coach, but was, was a, a U.S. born and raised person. The fact that you have people now who really understand the domestic game is essential and valuable in making that particular calculation as many local versus how many uh, overseas players you have. 
Lovely. Um, the author of Conflict, um, Ryan Ferguson, who was on the show the other week, has asked, who were the most famous viewers or people who emailed or contacted the old Channel 5 show? <laughs> he was. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Ryan's asking the question. Um, Ryan was one of our regular, regular top boy. And he was, he was young, wasn't he, Josh? I mean, yeah. when he first started... Um, I mean, if I remember rightly, he was watching the show without his parents knowing. I think he was. He still seems another... young. Yeah. I, I saw him at the the London series. I'm like, you still look young. He's aging well. But he, I mean, he really was probably what 14, 15 when he was watching the show, and I think yeah. he was literally watching it under his duvet without his parents knowing. So we were basically encouraging delinquency, which uh, possibly wasn't our intention. But no, Ryan was a top boy. He used to email in all the time. Um, we had a number of probably the number one for me was. Uh, was my good friend Mike Dowling, who was uh, always referred to himself as the UK's number one Giants fan. Um, and I met Mike for the first time at the London series, having communicated with him by text and Facebook for 10, 12 years plus. Um, and yet we'd never met. And we finally got to meet, which was great, which was top. But we had, we had loads. We? We, we, uh, we were very lucky to have great support in the media. Uh, Johnny alluded to his fantasy baseball playing and a lot of the members of that league were media members. So uh, Keith Blackmore, who's a fantastic person, used to run uh, the Times of London. Uh, Alan McKinley, who's a sports writer for uh, The Mirror. He's more than uh, that, JC. He's deputy yeah. editor of the sports. Su su super muckety muck now of sports there. Uh, yeah. There were a number of, of people in the media who love baseball and uh, supported it, I think, were amongst sort of the you know, yeah, Alan was a big supporter, but we, you know, we've had loads of uh, freelance support. Nick Schapanik, he's a football reporter with uh, a lot of, I think, freelance with the Times. Ivan Speck, he used to work predominantly, I think it was tennis with the Mail. And they're all massive, massive baseball fans. We've, we've known the boys for years, um, playing fantasy baseball with them, and they've all been very supportive. But I think probably the two names you mentioned first, Keith and, and, and Alan, were the, were the biggest supporters. Not really celebrities, but celebrities in our heart. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, Chris Atkins, who's the manager of the Birmingham Bandits, he, he's asked, with countries like Italy or the Netherlands leading the, way, leading the way in terms of European baseball, do you think there's room for Great Britain? And how should we forge our own identity in terms of playing style uh, in brackets in order to hopefully fill the void of British major? I think there's absolutely room. And in fact, to the, the premise that you're talking about Italy and Netherlands, actually the countries that are developing at the fastest rate are countries like the Czech Republic and Germany. So they sort of show the way on how to get better. And when you look at both those countries, if you go there, you can do a stadium tour in either of those two countries and go to proper baseball stadiums with proper stands, uh, even better than Farnham. Farnham's a great playing facility, but these are stadiums. And I think that the more that we're able to build those sort of stadiums again and get players excited about playing, there is nothing, I mean, as a guy who, my high school field was terrible. And I remember going off to college to a 3,000 uh, seat stadium and playing there. And it just elevated my spirits about playing. Uh, the opportunity to play in big stadiums can really motivate players to, to work at their game. So I think that that's a huge part of it is developing the infrastructure, as we said before. Awesome. Uh, Paul Vernon, a question for Josh. What do you remember about the Bracknell British Championship team and the finals from 2009? I have very fond memories of, of that team. Uh, that was my last year playing uh, if, in the British uh, Domestic League. And it was the only championship that, that Bracknell ever had. And it was really meaningful for me because uh, the first year I played in the British League was 2002. And at that point, there were a lot of really young kids on that team. Uh, the Trask brothers, uh, Ryan and Michael Trask, Phil Matthews, Matt Maitland, uh, Henry Collins. And these guys were so young. Now fast forward, and I switched teams over that period to help start the London Mets uh, senior program, had some success Judas. there. With that. <laughs> went back, went back uh, to play in my final year uh, for them. And to see those guys grow up and develop, we talked, Matt, we were talking about development. And these guys all developed a tremendous amount over that seven-year period. And for them to reach the pinnacle, win a national championship, and we were not the favorite team that year, it was so gratifying. And I mean, on a personal level, I went five for five in the championship game, uh, and that was my last game in Great Britain. 
So to have such a great outing, win a championship, go five for five, it was the ultimate drop the mic moment for me. Nice. And you weren't hit by a single pitch, were you, Jason? I was. I actually was five like- for five, and I had a hit by pitch. So I, I got six ABs in that game. We ended up I remember you that. telling me that was the only way you ABs used to get on base when you were playing uh, minor oh, w- When the count was 0-2, Goldie, I, I just I, – my elbow. elbow just in. I remember facing Rob Cordemans, who's one of the greatest pitchers in European baseball history, and he got me 0-2. He was trying to throw uh, like a slider in on me, and I put out my back leg, okay? Like it was that far in, and I stuck it out, got hit by a pitch. And I remember the Dutch catcher, this is the European champion, say, this guy just totally leaned in the ball, and I just kept jogging. I was on first base. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tom Pringle from Backflipping Nerds. Um, did you ever so. consider, yeah, did you ever consider calling the pod J squared? It's the two J's. We are squares. I mean, we are well, kind of. Looking house. at our heads, they are very square. Yeah. <laughs> looking at our dress sets, we are very square. I think yes. it would have been too painful and too close to home. Yes. We'd wake up in cold I sweats still... thinking about the name of our podcast. Uh, yeah. But we're actually going to rename it anyway because it's going to be Johnny and Josh and then in brackets, oh yeah, and that producer guy. What's his name? He wears a, he wears a, <laughs> he wears a tiger's hat all the time. <laughs> You don't have to get some flack, Eric. I don't know. Uh, I'm just yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'm calloused. I'm calloused. <laughs> <laughs> the amazing artist, uh, Andy Brown, has asked, oh, here we go. How did Josh get into curling and what do you enjoy about the game? And also, are there any transferable skills and similarities in baseball and curling? Okay, I'm like about to pop out of my seat because I'm so excited. First off, because Andy Brown is an amazing artist. Uh, the work he does, if your listeners haven't, looked at his work and he's gone around and seen more baseball stadiums and painted them more gloriously than anyone out there. So I'm a huge fan of Andy's. Um, I didn't ask him to give that question though. I love curly. So uh, I had to retire from baseball. I had uh, two knee surgeries uh, and 2016 was the final time I played baseball. I got to actually represent Great Britain as a member of the Southampton Mustangs uh, at a European cup competition got a line drive base hit on my last AB and then just hung up the spike. So I was looking for a lifetime sport, something that I could do uh, moving forward. And I live in Denver, Colorado now, and they have a great facility that they were just opening up. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take it up. And my goal was just to be a reasonable club player where someone's like, okay, I I can have Josh on my team. But got really lucky that I ended up uh, teaming up with three other players who were vastly better than I was. And we actually went on a run and made it to the U.S. National Championships, finished ninth in the U.S. We lost on the final throw to the U.S., the team that would end up representing the U.S. in the Olympics uh, that year in 2017, I guess, and won the gold medal. So we took the gold medalist to the final, our final throw. Uh, I love the sport beyond words. And what I love about it is that there are four players on each team, and each of them play a role in every single play. So you have the two sweepers who are communicating and also sweeping. You have the person who's holding the broom, who's determining line, and then the person throwing. And all of them are doing something. And that, to me, is very unique in sports. That level of communication requires the type of chemistry that you need for a show like this. Um, But what I love about it also is that it is a great cardio sport. Sweeping is really difficult. And so even though my body is broken, I can handle it enough uh, to be able to get a a proper workout. It's, It's very different than baseball, but there are are certain elements that are the same. I'd say most notably is the, the tactical and strategic element. What I loved about baseball is I play catcher and you have to really create a a pitch progression with your pitchers for every single batter. So you have to know, you know, what the batter's weaknesses are, what their tendencies are. You have to know what your pitcher strengths are. And then for every bat, you are literally creating a progression of pitches. You're not thinking about just the pitch that you're throwing. You're thinking, okay, is that going to set up what I'm going to throw next? And am I going to throw later in the count? And it's very similar in curling in terms of the throws that you make. And so I love that connection to the intellectual part of the game. Awesome. Uh, Johnny and Eric. Just to simplify that whole situation, Matt, (laughs) to really simplify that, at the end of the day, any sport that allowed a broken body to perform at the highest level and it involved a broom, JC was in there. The man is anal. He loves to sweep. End of story. Here's See, a goal. Yeah. I thought you would love it. Sweeping, cleanliness. I yes. am so OCD. jealous. I am OCD. so jealous. 
but you know, but see, the thing is, is, is derogatory comments about the sport of curling that uh, that we don't appreciate, do we, Josh? It's a, uh, I mean, nothing <laughs> uh, derogatory. I love it. But Goldie, it's it's you should know better, right? Because it's like saying baseball's glorified rounders. It just really reflects your ignorance, right? <laughs> Anyone who, who who mocks a sport that they don't really know. I'm not mucking the sport. I'm mucking you. You seem to be <laughs> missing the question here. I'm just talking about your love of a broom. I'm not, I'm not uh, dishing the sport of curling. I but love any, curling. Anyways, but big be, Olympic curling fan. I these, can't believe you took the Olympic champions. Yeah, the greatest bunch of guys too, by the way, John Schuster and his rink. When we made it to the nationals, we were like kind of the odd man out of the, the you had to go through like a huge qualifying process. And we, it was a Cinderella story. And they were the first people to come up to us and shake our hands and say, congratulations on making it here. You really deserve it. And there were a lot of other teams that weren't like that. Curling has that ethos that it's called the curling spirit about like really being a uh, sportsman. So I love that element too. I could talk about curling all day and I know that's not. So could I. <laughs> <laughs> and the only thing is the you know, last thing I'll say about curling, because this is a baseball podcast um, is that working on it as much as, because I also work on, on the winter Olympics as well for the BBC. And I'm always in charge of curling and hockey, but mostly curling because not many people here appreciate the sport or know the nuances of a sport who work in in sport and i know all the all the curlers from, uh, of course the, all the gb curlers are from scotland i know them all eve muirhead david murdoch and uh they are a wonderful bunch of people and it's, it's just a shame that only every once every four years it's a popular sport and then people forget all about it till next winter olympics and that's my end rant about curling on this baseball but to, podcast but to come full circle one of the reasons that uh we bought a flat in perth is because the world curling federation is there ken ross curling club the oldest curling club is quite close yeah, by you'll be the doers arena so, yes. so when it comes time to totally shut it down i am going and then and, and curling in perth so, so well, yeah, Matt, as you can see this podcast we're going to be doing is meant to be a baseball one but i can guarantee <laughs> i know we're, we're already approaching Approaching the hour or two about this, we got to I, curly now. So continue. Thank you, Andy Brown, for giving me my one moment. We can now return to baseball. I'd, I'd watch it. Thanks I'd listen place, to Andy. it. If, if you guys did a curling podcast, I think you'd have that much. Food. You, you'd, you'd have some. It. How many? Not very many curling movies or books that I can plug though. So, yes. Men with Brooms, starring Men Leslie Nielsen. One. one. Yeah, Leslie exactly. Nielsen of Airplane Flame was in a curling movie. Was that the Move title of the back. movie? Man with yes. Broom. Man with brooms. Okay, now let's go back to baseball. Let's go back to baseball. Yeah, we digress. That's going on my list. After I watched that movie that Johnny was in back in the day, I think I'll... Uh... Being a queen of the jungle. Did you get cut out, Gouldy? I thought you were uh, left on the cutting room floor. Look, mate, it's bad enough I got edited out, but Time Out Magazine called it the worst film in cinematography history. How do you think I feel not being good enough for the worst film ever made? But, Gouldy, if you hadn't been edited out, it would have been the third worst film ever made. <laughs> You never knew your potential. Hey, I'm a great believer. I don't believe in mid-table mediocrity. I'm either going to be the best or the worst. That's all I'm interested in. <laughs> Jonathan Kremen from the London Mets and Great Britain national team. He would like to ask Josh, how much were you panicking on the broadcast 2007, the day the Mets won their first NLB, uh, NBL? Oh. Sorry. That, that brings me back. First, uh, shout out to Jonathan Kremen, a great baseball guy. Uh, just absolutely bleeds the sport. Uh, I knew him when he was a young teenager. He's now a full-fledged adult uh, and a really just great baseball guy. So what he was alluding to was in 2007 was the year we created the London Mets senior team. And we went on a real Cinderella run. We were not the best team in the league. We weren't even the second best team in that league. And uh, the best team were the Corden uh, Pirates. They had gone undefeated throughout the whole season. And we were able to get into the playoffs uh, win a semifinal game against Liverpool, which had one of the best pitchers in British baseball, a guy named Martin Godsall. We were able to just beat him in a really tight game. And then we won a best two out of three final against Croydon, winning two straight. And so it was just a shocking uh, championship. And I, stupidly, because I didn't know whether we'd have a chance, and I was the player manager of the team, I said, look, guys, if we win this, I'll bring you, I'll bring you over to, to the show. Um, when we're, uh, you know, filming it so that we, you know, we can fully celebrate. So everyone held me to that. We went to, there was a great curry place right across the street, that both Johnny and I'm sure Eric remember, right across the street from uh, the studios. We went, we ate a lot. They drank a lot. I mean, these guys, you know, you win a, you win a national championship and, you know, you're going to celebrate. They're drinking out of the cup. I mean, it is sloppy. 
So I bring them over and I'm scared to death. You know, I've been doing this show for a while, but you know, I, I don't want to lose it that night. And they all come out. And uh, I remember I, we were doing a, a pre-tape. I was talking about Coors Field and they're like heckling me from behind. And uh, thankfully they were able to keep it together and it wasn't too bad, uh, but it was, uh, it was a scary proposition, but very memorable uh, for many reasons that night. I've got one last question. This comes from um, British Baseball Podcast superfan, a uh, Johnny Gould. Uh, he has asked, uh, Josh, is it true that Jonathan Gould recently whooped you in a season of fantasy baseball? Uh, I I don't pay enough attention to properly know, to be honest. You are. Gould, Gouldy, Gouldy just lives and dies by this stuff. I draft a team and then we'll occasionally pop in because I actually do other things with my life. But Gouldy, if you did win, I'm so happy for you. You need this, buddy. You need it. And uh, so The answer is yes, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> it no, just broke. I didn't perhaps, even beat it. I, maybe. I was in front of him for the whole season for all 162 games. <laughs> That's all you need. I, Gouldy, how many times did you win the big fantasy league? Okay, I, and how, I have okay, and I failed. Only, this, I, this right, and we're I supposed only to say wrap it up, Matt, because the guys, yeah, gonna, and, these guys and, will go on for hours about fantasy. I just, I just, gotta, just so we had one fantasy league with this really fancy trophy, and I was only in it till I moved back to the states. I think I was only in it six years. I won it twice. Gouldy has been in it for like 18 years and he's never won it. I haven't even come second. Third's the best so, I've done. So Gouldy, Gouldy, this hand right here, you shut it. You're only as good as your last championship, big guy. <laughs> and uh, same, same, uh, same listener has also asked a question to Eric. Is it true that you only remove your baseball cap to take a shower? Uh, at funerals as well. Uh, and weddings. Not bar mitzvahs, though. Not bar mitzvahs. Hats bar mitzvahs. <laughs> yeah, it's really not he a good as a keeper, right? So. <laughs> he has a special hat for his wedding. It's a white one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, gentlemen, that brings us to the end of, of, the, of the recording and the, the uh, conversation. I've had an absolute blast. I really can't wait to hear what, what the show show itself. Again, thank you so much for agreeing to come on and, and talk. Um I always like to leave the final word open to the guests. So, Eric, I'll uh, I'll leave it to you. Any shout outs? Any recommendations? Any um, any parting words? No, no. Actually, I want to say thank you very much for it because I want to say thank you to Matt because this was a good dress rehearsal for what's about to come up with our podcast. And now I just know we're, we're, I'm going to have to ring in these guys even more. It's going to bring back to the dark days of me yelling to their earpieces. But uh, this has been a very good litmus test for what's to come no problem always always the bridesmaid never the bride i'll uh, I'll, I'll take being in practice any day of the week <laughs> uh, oh, johnny? your podcast is important too oh thank you that means a lot uh johnny any anything from yourself well matt first of all thank you to you and to your listeners for having us on we've uh, we've loved it it's always uh, it's always a pleasure um and uh, obviously re read the podcast that we're doing we're looking forward to uh, hopefully um, having the company of everyone that listens in with you guys as well. And uh, I think the, the information is now out in terms of the format or the portals or words that I don't understand uh, in terms of gaining access. So we really hope that everybody will will tune in and join us. Um, a huge thanks to you, mate. I mean, I know you wanted us to choose some questions as well. I've got a few suggestions about the two best questions. who are yep. going to win Joel's very kind. Um, I definitely want to give Molly in Bristol one. Uh, just only because she's my neighbour and she's driving women's baseball forward. Good on you, Molly. Um, I was looking at some of the others. There's some absolutely disgraceful ones. Andy, the artist, who clearly didn't ask the question. He just just wanted to talk <laughs> early. So, Andy, I'm afraid you haven't won. Um, but I think probably Ian Bleach, who asked a couple of questions right in the top, and I particularly enjoyed answering because uh, it was one of the few questions uh, that we had from the listeners uh, that actually asked Eric and I anything because everyone just wanted to talk to Josh. So for that reason alone, Ian, you're a legend. Ian Bleach, you're my second winning questionnaire. So that's it from me. Thank you, guys. I'll hand you back to the legend that is Mr. Josh Chetwell. Josh, yeah, Matt, that, Josh. Thank you so much. Uh, again, you know, you've had me on twice. So your patience is of a, a quality that probably surpasses most human beings. But... <laughs> This show is great. I'm so grateful for anyone who does podcasts, anyone in the British baseball community who's reaching out and trying to press force with the gospel of, of baseball in the UK. Uh, you all do God's work. So thank you so much for that. And as Goldie mentioned, you can find us uh, on 
various social media platforms. If you go on Facebook, it's the Josh and or the Josh. I'm already trying to take top belly. The Johnny <laughs> and Josh show. Uh, the, we have a group there. Uh, please find us on Twitter at Johnny and Josh or Instagram at Johnny and Josh. And if you go to any of those places, you can find we've now posted our trailer. So you can find that there. And uh, we would love to just help expand the community. I mean, that's all we're trying to do is just be yet another voice trying to help uh, talk baseball amongst the British audience and, and continue to move forward. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. That's perfect. And uh, all the best with the show. I'll make sure that I post all the links where I can within the show notes and uh, we'll be hearing from you very soon. Thank you, Matt. Best of luck with your podcast for the future, buddy. Cheers very Thanks, much. Matt.